Do y'all think that the better team won, or was this just a bad game? Got a, they got a cloud hanging over their head. You execute when you're supposed to execute, and we didn't do that. They were the better team in that game. All right, well, uh, it was a wild weekend once again around the SEC. Georgia was able to take down the number one team in the nation. I mean, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mean, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. After further discussion, uh, that did not actually happen. Texas remains undefeated. Um, that was my bad. That was my bad. Sorry. Um, just kidding. Uh, you know what I'm referring to. Uh, we'll get to that and uh, many other exciting games from last week. Uh, we have an A&M guest on the show uh, for the first time ever, and we'll make predictions for yet another exciting weekend as the hits just keep coming. But first, let's check in with our hosts. Jesse, how are you doing? Um... I mean, I'm I'm fine. It's 2012. Um, <laughs> the number one song right now is by some guy named like Gautier or whatever, somebody that I used to know. Yeah, we won a national championship last year. We're probably going to win another one this year. Nick Saban's oh our gosh. coach. Everything is fine. Have we Everything already reverted fine. to watching old stuff? Um, I feel really bad for this guy named Manti Teo and his girlfriend, like <laughs> RIP. But yeah, I mean, in 2012, oh man, I'm doing well. Man, I don't, I don't, I, I'm trying to think what I was doing in 2012, and the, I'm I, a sophomore. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's fine. Matt, it's fine. how are you doing, my friend? I see uh, there's a, there's a cloud behind you. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Feeling pretty good right now. Yeah. Things are going very well right there. All my friends are uh, enjoying a little a little smoke rooney because we beat that ass. <laughs> I'm just imagining the smoke being a fire. Love it. I, I absolutely love it. I can't. I can't continue. We're going to have to sign off right now. Um, yeah, so as you, as you, um, probably figured out, uh, there's some interesting things happened, uh, this past weekend, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get into them, uh, right now, as soon as I, uh, share audio, because that's what I do. <laughs> Always remember, if you ain't first, you're last. All right, so let's, No, sometimes uh, you could be second, or third, or fourth. You could. <laughs> <laughs> I was high when I told or you 15. that. 15. Sometimes you could be 15. <laughs> right. Fine. Oh man. All right, let's uh, let's talk oh about God. Auburn. Wait, wait a minute. How are, how are, how are we 2 minutes into the podcast and we're already off this the is, rails? This is probably the quickest digression we have ever it. had. It really. Well, you started it Wes, with your I did. with your bottle throwing stuff or excuse me. The Texas student <laughs> section started it with their bottle throwing stuff. I did. We'll, I did. we'll get to it. Go ahead. Let's talk about Auburn at Missouri. Uh, Missouri winning this one 21 to 17. I got the point here. Uh, interesting game as Brady Cook went out with injury early in this game. Uh, and then Mizzou kind of helped Auburn out a little bit in the middle of this game with some costly mistakes, including a muff punt by Luther Burden uh, that was recovered for a touchdown. Um, but then as the uh, game progressed, uh, Brady Cook came back in and Mizzou kind of just seized the momentum. Momentum is going to be a, a theme in a lot of these games uh, today, <laughs> uh, but uh, but Mizzou certainly sees the momentum once he came back in and didn't look back. So Mizzou won this one 21-17. Jesse, what are your thoughts on this one? I mean, this one was weird. <laughs> it was, it Very was weird. maybe not for us because I think we've, we've talked about how sus Mizzou is. I mean, they have a super easy schedule, right? So maybe on this pod, we're not as surprised as, as others. But Auburn's first half performance, comedy of errors. I mean, not great. You got poor blocking, missed throws, fumbles, penalties, questionable play calling. Like all of that Back. held them to three first half points. That's not good. That's not a good look, Mr. Freeze. It's not a good look. Um, and they really, they couldn't sustain finishing drives. And that's been an issue for them this entire season. So for me, I'm just not seeing Auburn progress throughout the season. I mean, I understand starting maybe a little bit sketchy. You're kind of getting your groove, but it doesn't seem like Auburn's been able to find that identity uh, throughout the season. And and we're we're more than halfway through. So I don't know when they're going to. 
this is the time to find it. And I'm not sure that that they're going to. I bet they find it the week before they play Bama. I'm (laughs) sure they will. Possible. Well, they're getting restless. We'll give them an an identity. We'll just we'll just gift (laughs) it. Just gift it. Uh, They are getting restless down on the plains. Matt, what your your thoughts here? Uh, Listen, Auburn. I gave you one job. One job and one job only. You had one bloody job, and your job was to beat Missouri, and you failed. You failed. You get an F for me for the week. Um, <laughs> this Listen, I don't know how Brady Cook can get injured and then ride in an ambulance to the hospital, get dealt with at the hospital, get back in the ambulance and drive back to the stadium, and American then come in modern and still throw for almost 200 yards. Make, make it make sense, because <laughs> that makes no sense. Um, I think Jesse's right. Uh, what is Auburn's identity? I really feel like they are in such dire need for a quarterback. No disrespect to Peyton Thorne. I know he's trying to make, you know, bricks without straw, but it just, there's nothing there. I mean, um, not to mention the fact that there were a ton, and this is going to be a theme for a lot of the games going forward this week. There were a ton of sacks in this game. Um, Mm -hmm. Grand total of, hold on, I lost the number. I was just looking at it a second ago and now it's gone. Uh, a lot like the pass rush or the pass defense in both of these offenses this week. Uh, eight total sacks in this game, which is a lot. Um, also, in Auburn, Auburn, listen to me. Come here. You can't go 15-0 and in the fourth quarter and give up 15 fourth quarter points and expect to win a ball game. That's not how that works. Do better. Yeah. You can't win that way. No, you certainly can't. All right, let's move to South Carolina at Oklahoma. Uh, South Carolina trouncing Oklahoma 35 to 9. I had to actually go back and look because I was like, is that 25? No, it was 35. It was that big of a difference. Uh, Jesse gets the point here. Uh, I don't typically put blowouts in the show, uh, but I only include this one because it was, I mean, a shock to me. Uh, Brent Venables ended up benching Hawkins, who he's, uh, you know, started for a while now and returning back to the starter at the beginning of the season, Jackson Arnold, uh, but they just couldn't get anything going on offense, uh, even after that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. I don't know what Oklahoma needs to do or what they can do at this point. Matt, what are your, what are your thoughts? Uh, again, I, I think Oklahoma's in a state right now where they just they can't get anything going offensively. It's like the cupboard is bare in Norman when you're looking for offensive production, and I say that as a Tennessee fan. Um, it, it's just one of those situations where they can't seem to get anything rolling. And then when you're turning the ball over four times, and if you're giving up the number of sacks that that offensive line did this week, you can't do anything offensively. Um, I'm not sure what this means for Beamer. And I don't know what this means for South Carolina. They looked a lot better than they have in previous weeks. Um, Sellers still is kind of up and down for me. I'm still not sold on him being the guy. Um, But, you know, it is what it is. Carolina found a way to get points on the board. Um, They coasted in the second half, though. So, well, I guess we'll find out. By the way, I need someone to explain to me how how Raheem Sanders gets 15 carries and he gets 33 total yards. Make that make sense. What was the offensive line doing in that particular situation? Um, um, by the way, if, total. I, if, 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 I'm, if I'm coming off kind of feisty tonight, I apologize ahead of time. It's all good. We, we've we all it's, been there. It's, <laughs> it's the nicotine. <laughs> you got a little nicotine buzz going on. Jesse, what do you got? I mean, for me, it was just Beamer was able to capitalize on mistakes that OU made. I mean, they took three of the first quarter turnovers, and it was 21 quick points all right and they were burying OU before the game really got started and I think the one thing that if I'm an OU fan I'm worried about is you literally may not make a bowl yeah Yeah, that's a problem no that's that's yeah that's valid um okay sorry Jesse let's move to uh, number seven Alabama at number 11 Tennessee Tennessee winning this one 24 to 17 Matt gets the point here um, I am not going to waste my breath here. I, <laughs> as Jesse leaves, uh, I have two, two Jesse, people already. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I have two people already on the show who are heavily invested in these fandoms. So I'm just going to get out of the way and let them talk about it. Matt, let's start with you. Obviously, I know you're excited to talk about it. What, what you got? Um, 
<laughs> just wow. I I I don't understand anything about football anymore. Every week I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on what this Tennessee team's gonna do. And then they come out and they, they completely blow those concepts out of the water. Um I don't know what Hypel is saying to these guys during halftime. Um, but he needs to say it before the game starts too. Um, because in the last three games, we have gotten shut out in the first half. Offense can't do anything in the first half, but the last couple of games, once halftime gets there, um, they, they, they look like world beaters. If Tennessee could play two complete halves in a ball game, they would be really tough to beat. Um, I heard that before. <clears throat> Ain't that the truth? Um, also, on another note, uh, another thing that I really feel like played a big part in this particular game is crowd noise. Neyland is a thing. Neyland Loud is a thing. It's a big thing. Um, you know, I saw a picture that was floating around on Twitter, so take that with a grain of salt, uh, that said that the crowd noise got up to about 128 decibels uh, during that third and fourth quarter. By the way, to give you some scale, jet engines usually top out. Uh, is at 130 decibels, so you're talking about major ear damage uh, at that point. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't know exactly how disruptive that was. Like, that's one of those things you can't really measure, but I know for a fact that that Milro and the Bama offense had some issues. There were a couple of false starts, a couple of delayed games, and I think the crowd noise plays a part in there. Um, people like to crap on Tennessee, uh, especially Neyland saying it's an erector set and a whole bunch of other stuff. But you can't argue with the fact that that, that crowd brings the noise when they need to. Um, on a separate note, I've seen recently in the last couple hours, because I spend most of my time on Twitter when I'm not doing things productively, um, <clears throat> there's been some uh, certain people that played quarterback at the University of Alabama that have made some comments about how there was crowd noise pumped into the stadium. There is also, during the broadcast during the game, where the radio play-by-play -play guy for Bama said that Tennessee was pumping in crowd noise. Um, there has been a lot of movement on that particular topic over the last couple of hours. So, I would like to come very close to the camera. I would like to get very intimate with you when I tell you this. Um, if you're one of those people that thinks that we're piping in, uh, piping in crowd noise, um, I would like to quote the great philosopher that said it a long time ago, you can go get bent. So we're not piping in crowd noise. We don't have to do that. That's not a thing we have to do. Um, huh? Who is the QB? AJ McCarron. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I saw that tweet. I'll send it to you. I saw that this afternoon. I was like, okay, AJ, you really want to die on this hill, buddy? You go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Vol Twitter's been a flutter. Um, getting back to the game, now that we've gotten kind of the ancillary stuff out, it, uh, out of the way, I need Nico to figure out what in the world's going on with his passing. Um, because it doesn't make sense to me. There's a lot of things where he's just right there and he's just hair off and it's killing me because if he ever gets everything lined up and if the passing game really starts to plop, starts to pop like it's supposed to, Tennessee's offense is going to be hardcore dangerous. Um, Dylan Sampson, again, is a freaking beast. 17 touchdowns on the year, 838 yards. He's averaging almost six yards a carry. In SEC play, he's carry, He's uh, averaging almost five yards a carry, which if you're getting half of first down every time you touch the ball, you're doing some good things. James Pierce and this defense are really good. James Pierce is, um, I think some, I saw it on Twitter earlier that he's pressuring or putting asserting pressure on the quarterback on 25% of his snaps. That's insane. Um, He's not getting the stats that a lot of people think that are going to be worthy of a first rounder, but James Pierce is making his um, making his presence known, and this defense is looking lights out. It really makes me concerned, and Jesse, I think this is a problem you'll be familiar with. Um, I'm not sure if Tim Banks is going to be the D coordinator at Tennessee next year. After the performance that we've seen over the last couple of months, there's a good chance that someone's going to roll the dice and probably make him a head coach, um, which would hurt me personally, spiritually, ecumenically, every which way you can get it. Um, another little caveat with this game, there are way too many penalties and turnovers for my taste. A lot of penalties and turnovers for this uh, uh, for, for this game. I was not a huge fan of that. Uh, and, and, you know, I was happy to get the win. There were a lot of people that were really upset with the way we played the first half, but that's why we play two halves. And to Bama, I would just like to say, good game. You got it close, but no cigar, kids. All right. All right, Jesse. <laughs> um, okay. I've been thinking about this a lot. I yelled a lot of things on Saturday um, that I, I won't repeat here. 
they're I not think we've all been there too uh yeah we're they're not there the first half <laughs> um i don't think either team played well in this game i think oh. there were so many mistakes i think there were so many penalties and i think both fan bases obviously Tennessee be happy you got out with a win but I think we're both really frustrated at how this game looked because it wasn't pretty it, it was not a pretty game um I'll address penalties first because Matt you kind of got into it we had 15 penalties for Alabama 10 of which occurred in the first half obviously false starts you know I think that's definitely something that the kneeling crowd played a part a part in which is good for them um, that's what you want to happen, but I don't think our guys could hear. So I get it right. Because we, we went into Neyland again, um, for this is kind of our second time going in there with over 10 penalties. I mean, I think last time we set a record with 17, that noise played a part certainly, but it wasn't the only penalty that we got, right. We had holding calls. We had personal fouls. We had roughing the passer, which I was pissed off about. That, that a, roughing that the passer that we did was so late after our guy hit him so late. There is no excuse. That is undisciplined. That is juvenile. And it pisses off your fan base. Grow up. If you don't like it, if you're, if you're frustrated with how things are going, do better. That's it. Do better. It's fair. You you want to be treated like an adult, act like an adult. That made me really mad. I was really embarrassed by that because that's this is not the first time we've seen that behavior. Right? Like we've seen our guys act really immature and in a way that I don't think Nick Saban would have would have been okay with. I mean, he came off the field. I didn't see DeBoer walk up to him. I didn't see anybody walk up to him. He was just like me, me, me. That makes me incredibly frustrated as a fan. Um, Jesse, real quick, did you did you see the jump shots on fourth down? I saw it afterwards. I didn't see it during the game. At, I saw at it at the afterwards. same time, right? There's two of not them. A, yeah. Not a good not look. A good not look. a good look. Um, I was probably I going to refill my adult beverage at that point, <laughs> um, which happened several times. But we shot ourselves in the foot with those penalties. We were not playing disciplined football, which gets me to the next point. This was a very poorly coached game. And thus far, I am seeing a very poorly coached team. You mentioned your defensive coordinator. I'd like to offer mine up as a replacement if you'd like him. Because I don't want nothing to do I with that guy. <laughs> I don't want him. Um, I, I don't understand, and I'm going to continue to say it. Yes, we got a little bit of pressure on Nico, but not nearly enough. I do not understand the reluctance to blitz or to stack the box in any way. I just don't understand it. It's very frustrating. We were lucky on defense because we have such a young secondary that Nico made some throws that were like, oh, he probably should have caught that, but he was just a hair off. Thank God. Uh, because that that made this game stay within, uh, you know, a close shot for us. We know that we have a very young secondary. We've got to get pressure on the quarterback. It's very, very frustrating on the offensive side of the ball. We are not adjusting at halftime at all. We're, we're not adjusting. We played very well in the first half of the Georgia game. And that's what I'm going to use because it was the one time this season that I felt like we had an identity was that first half. We were killing them on the edge. We were adjusting. We were doing a lot of smart plays. We were actually opening up the playbook. And it's like, after that first half, nah, nah. It's fine. And Jalen, probably his worst game. I'm going to say it. Probably his worst game. He has been making very poor decisions. I understand he was not getting a lot of time, which that's on our offensive line. But still, even when he had a little bit of time and when he was looking and making his reads, they weren't smart decisions. It's very frustrating to see. Um, And I don't feel like our offense has a an identity outside of like, hopefully Ryan Williams is there and is going to catch it for us. That's it. And that's not an identity that's grasping at straws. And it's, again, it's frustrating to see. I, I don't like seeing, and I said it last week or not last week, but I said it. Um, yeah, last week and the week before that, 
I don't like seeing how happy DeBoer is after a game. I don't yeah. like the cool as a cucumber. I don't like the, it's fine. It's, uh, da, 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 da. it's, it's not fine. And I'm saying that because your job is literally in jeopardy every week with us. This was probably the worst job to accept for anybody because nobody wants to follow in Nick Saban's shoes. Somebody had to do it. I get it. But that comes with a sense of like, you have to own this every week. And I'm seeing undisciplined football. I'm seeing guys act stupid during games. It's, mm. And I'm seeing a coach that is not getting after his coordinators. There's no play that's getting better. And I'm a very frustrated Alabama fan. I understood that once Nick Saban left, that it was going to be like this. But when you can't play football in the state of Tennessee, that's a problem. That's a problem. We have not been ranked this low since I was legitimately a freshman in high school. And they haven't lost, two, what, two games before November since, was it the early 2000s? I think it was 2007, 2007. wasn't it? The first yeah. year of Nick Saban, since 2007. I get it. Okay. The first year of Kalen DeBoer. Fine. Da, 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 da. But this is this is frustrating. The Alabama faithful are frustrated. Even it's when a, we win, we're frustrated. It's a weird dynamic because, you know, I've spent so many years of my life as a Georgia fan uh, going into games thinking like a 50-50 mindset. We might win. We might lose. Sometimes it's a good possibility we're going to lose. And spending a lot of my life that way, what Bama fans have gotten so used to, like losing is like a, a major event. It just doesn't happen. And so yeah. when it's happened twice already, you know, people start to panic. And I think this is what we were kind of afraid of for DeBoer is that, you know, just because he's, you know, maybe doing a little bit more like uh, down to earth, like a lot of people would, um, people are going to start to panic at that. Is And well, and I think it'd be different if we lost and and I knew that we left everything on the field, like we just right. got outplayed, you know, mm -hmm. if we went out there, we were being coached correctly. Our guys were doing what they were supposed to do. And we lost. I can't be mad at that. I can't be mad when you put it yeah. all out there, yeah. you're doing your best and you're clearly, you know, making adjustments. You're, you're trying things. I'm not mad at that. That's fine. You know, it, we get outplayed, we get outplayed. Right. That wasn't it. <laughs> right. If we didn't have talent on the field, fine. You know, yeah. that wasn't it. I think that's the frustrating thing is all of the pieces are there and we yeah. need a leader to bring it together. And we need coaches and coordinators that are going to maximize our talent. And I'm yeah. not seeing that. And that's what's frustrating. Yeah. Losing is annoying. But the way in which we are losing is the frustrating part. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick bef before we move on, Matt, I believe two years ago when Tennessee beat Bama for the first time in forever, I don't I don't think you were on the show. I don't think you were able Wasn't. to join us. I, I yeah. missed that week. That's the reason why I had to celebrate <laughs> okay, this okay. one. <laughs> so there you go. I'll let All it right. go. I'll let it slide. By, by, the way, by the way, I do want to get y'all's opinion on this. So the storming the field thing. Yeah. Where, where are we at? I didn't understand it. I was like, I, two years ago, hundred percent get it. They're like this, it, there are some people who had not been able to send a tweet because it didn't exist or Twitter didn't exist when, when Tennessee had last beaten Alabama. Uh, so I get the excitement over that. This, I don't know, maybe act, act like, like been there. You literally like you've have. done it before. <laughs> now, now I want to point out to you when I was watching the end of the game, I saw the, the, the tides, I hate to use the phrase tied, but I saw I saw the the run on and I was like, mm, are we really doing this, guys? Like, I get I it. I understand. You're excited. I, 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 so I, when I was watching it at the end, the game ended and I saw everyone in the stands and I was like, OK, they contained themselves. And then I look later and realized well, that they didn't. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. It, it was not the students that started the push. Mm -hmm. It was the recruits that were in the building oh. that jumped the fence and started the rush. Which is, there yet. Come which is on, an interesting, which is an interesting, is an interesting little dynamic. I'm like, well, if the recruits are charging the field, like, 
what's that say about yeah. stuff? Like, it's just, I, I didn't care for it, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, man, whatever. Tennessee's got plenty of money. We can afford new, new we can afford the fine. It is what it is. But yeah, I will really, say, don't I will, waste the will, money that could go I, into your NIL account. I will take a note I will from say, Vandy, Vandy, cut it up and sell it, and you can pay your fine that way. Well, there's been a movement to talk about that too, but I will say that I think that if we do it again, the only other team I think at this point that would be okay for field rush would be if we beat Georgia at home. I really think that would be the only acceptable form at this point. It's Everybody this else, year, though, like, so. I, I, I know. I meant general, like next yeah, year yeah. or after or 10 years from now when we finally get around to beating Georgia. But you get the hey, idea. Uh, who, who knows the way things are lately? Good point. Um, all right, let's move to number 14, Texas A&M at Mississippi, Mississippi State. Uh, A&M winning this one 34-24. Um, Matt and I both had the same differential. Did the math. I got the point here. Sorry for all the weird numbers and squiggly lines. Um, point. <clears throat> I know. Um, this one reminded me a lot of the Georgia Mississippi State game, where it's almost even the same score. I think ours was 31 21 or something like that. Uh, Van Buren seems to be gaining confidence every game at the quarterback quarterback position for Mississippi State. So kudos to him. Uh, Connor Wigman didn't have his best game, he had a couple of picks, uh, but AM survives and finds itself uh, with a massive showdown coming up. So, you know. Uh, they're in the running and undefeated in conference play. Jesse, what do you got for this one? I mean, the fact that my team has the same or no, we have a, a worse record than a and M. I just, I'm in my feelings. Everything is terrible. <laughs> um, but no, I think on the well, opposite side, it's, it's one of those things. And, and we'll talk about it a little bit when we get into our interview, but it, it just goes to show how, when you have the right coach in place, no matter how, abysmal things look you really can turn around a program i mean jimbo fisher left a m in shambles and ruins would be a better word for it just. yeah and they're i mean on fire ash and they're mm -hmm. they're making things happen and i think with mississippi state again unfortunately you know they have to have a new coach but they are showing some life they're yeah. starting to develop an identity they're 100%. not winning yet but there is some positivity there so i would say Next season, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep an eye out for Miss State because they're putting up points against some decent programs. Yeah. Matt? Uh, I didn't get a chance to really see a whole lot of this one, but I will tell you this. The fact that Mississippi State for two weeks in a row or three weeks in a row or whenever um, they played Georgia, I mean, they're making some waves. Now, they're, they're right there. They're still kind of – I mean, they're one and six in the conference. It's not like they're world beaters at this point. Um, but I mean, they are showing signs of life and that's, that's gotta be something if you're a Mississippi state fan, you gotta be feeling a little bit better about it. I was talking to Emily who we talked about, uh, talked to earlier in the season. Um, and I was hanging out with her when, uh, the games were on. I said, Emily, did you see the score of the Mississippi state game? She went, we probably lost by 10. And I was like, mm, you're right. You did. <laughs> so she wasn't real thrilled about that, but she was also very accepting. Um, it's not that bad. And really, it's not, especially when you look at, I mean, this is top 15 A&M team. They've only got a loss to Notre Dame, um, and they've got a chance to make a name for themselves this weekend when they play LSU. Um, I think that you were on the money about Van Buren, Jesse. I think he's going to, he's turning into a pretty good uh, quarterback. Connor Wigman also didn't have that great of a time, but uh, again, they survive. The, the name of the game in the SEC this season is Endure and Survive. That's all you can do. Um, there's nobody that's a clear cut one, as we'll talk about when we talk about the Texas game. Nobody looks great. Everybody looks good, but nobody looks great. So the SEC, I think SEC shorts, if you could, if you're listening, if you could just do like, um, a mock survivor with the SEC, <laughs> because it truly is like outwit outlast. We're just it trying really to really is. It really We're all is surviving some better than others. Um, some of us are not doing well at tribal council, but please. Please make that a thing. Yeah, a lot of a lot of crazy voting going on behind the scenes. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's move to the Pigskins and Pageantry game of the week. It was Georgia at Texas, number five Georgia, at number one Texas at the time. Uh, Georgia winning this one, thirty to fifteen. Matt is the only one hold to on, pick hold Georgia. On, what you hold got? On, Wes. Hold on, hold hmm. on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Wes. Yeah. You guys beat the number one team on the road. You don't sound nearly as excited about this as you should. Well, I want you on. to do that. No, 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 no. I want you to do that read again, but okay. with more pep. 
Right. It's fa faster with more more pep. Okay. Um, yes. Let's see. Not number faster. five, Georgia at number Here one, Texas. Georgia winning this yeah. one, 30 to 15. And I am so elated right now. Uh, Matt is the only one to pick Georgia. He got the point here. Uh, first, I want to say that I was shocked <laughs> with the dominance that Georgia showed in the first half, especially. Um, uh, defense absolutely dominated. And the offense, while it struggled, did enough. 23 to zero at halftime uh, for this one. Uh, one thing that was interesting, the squib kick to begin the second half, a little bit weird. Uh, Kirby yeah. said he thought it was a, a miss hit, but uh, I don't know. Maybe he was trying to defend some decisions with uh, some coach speak of his own. I don't know if it was a coaching staff thing or if that was a player thing, whatever. Anyways, whatever it was, gave them great field position to start things off there. Um, so I will say that the refs made a bad call on the PI on Texas. I will say that they missed it, it, it could have gone both ways, but probably more so it should not have been called. Uh, they did miss a PI on Dylan Bell on our drive before that would have kept the drive alive. So I'm just going to throw that out there for whatever. Uh, but the behavior by the fans, and I, I don't think it was just students because it was all over the place. If you're looking on TV um, to, to throw trash on the field in protest for that particular call unacceptable just an, an unacceptable thing for anyone to do uh i know matt there's some some feelings there for tennessee it, you know whatever <clears throat> I, I, bottles. Listen, I didn't see have, mustard bottles so. when, <laughs> that's again that's a that's a personal brand choice that we use at the university that's, true, that's right that's, yeah. a, that's an nil what do they say in sec but, shorts it's more it's more aer aerodynamic so more aerodynamic exactly yeah. right yeah. so uh that, that behavior unacceptable uh the decision was changed and I, I think they got the call right, but I get why Kirby was mad about that. It's not that the call wasn't correct. It's that they're setting a dangerous precedent by allowing basically a riot to determine a call. And because they had already spotted the ball, this wasn't like they were going to review it. They had already uh -huh. spotted the ball ready to go. And um, so whether or not that's why they changed the call because of the, you know, the, the fans throwing stuff is irrelevant because that's how it was going to be perceived. Right. Uh, so we we'll get to that more on that later. Uh, Texas scored right after that to make it 23, 15 talking about momentum, momentum key in this one as well. The uh, so with that in mind, Georgia's got to try to seize that momentum back now. That's been kind of shifted the very next drive, big pass from Carson Beck to Arian Smith. And then the play right after that trick play to Oscar Delp to get us, you know, way down the field. That was huge in kind of seizing that momentum back. And then later on in that drive, uh, Trevor Etienne having to score twice on the final set of downs. Uh, I thought it was hilarious because they were reviewing the one where he clearly stretched the ball it, and broke the plane. Herb Street uh, on the broadcast is like, oh, that's easy. That's an easy call. It's a touchdown. And then the refs come on. They're like, actually, uh, call in the field stands. And uh, so uh, ETN had to score again uh, on fourth down, which I thought was a good call. You're on like the one inch line. So even if you don't make it, they're, they're super backed up. Right. Um, um, so, and then uh, Michael Williams forced a fumble on Texas very next possession uh, recovered by the dogs and the momentum was back in full swing in, in Georgia's favor. Um, honestly, I felt like another call was missed near the end where ETN probably got that first down, uh, at the end would have put the game away sooner. Uh, but, um, you know, whatever defense stepped up again as they had almost all night and, and put the game on lockdown. One, um, photo that I thought was fantastic and just, you know, hang it in the Louvre is, uh, where you had both Manning and yours sitting on the bench right out. And they just both looked absolutely shell shocked. Like what in the world just happened? Um, and so I thought that was great. Um, and you know, I'm not getting ahead of myself because, you know, obviously it's a great win. Uh, it's a, it's a huge win for Georgia's confidence, especially after, uh, the debacle in Alabama, which I think oddly enough, kind of prepared them for this game being in that hostile environment in Alabama, I think prepared them for this as well. Uh, but I'm not getting ahead of myself. We might have to play them again, especially if both teams play well from, from here on out. So, you know, who knows, there may be a rematch for this one. So, you know, we're we're quite familiar with who gets the last laugh in the SEC because it happens. So <clears throat> let's talk about the uh, penalties doled out by the SEC and Greg Sankey. So 
because of the uh, throwing garbage on the field and everything, uh, they incurred several fi uh, fines and other penalties. One of them is a $250,000 fine. Chump change, Matthew McConaughey can just, you know, pay that out of his back pocket, whatever. They don't really care about that one. But um, they are they are required to use all available security, stadium, and television video to identify individuals who threw objects and ban them from Texas athletic events for the remainder of the 24-25 academic and athletic year. Um, and then in addition to that, they're reviewing the Texas alcohol availability policies. And while the SEC did announce they would not be suspending alcohol sales at Texas, they have said that they do reserve the right to do so if certain things aren't met from here on out and if they don't comply with other things. Uh, the university has to provide a report to the conference office to summarize its efforts to identify and penalize offenders and its plan to enact policies to prevent future similar incidents while ensuring compliance with conference standards. Blah, blah, blah. So anyways, you get it. There's a lot being handed down here. Uh, I think Greg Sankey had to do this because it's, look, it's not just a bad look for the conference. It's dangerous and could lead to worse things if they let them get away with this. Because if, if it's a perception to all fan bases now that, oh, well, if I don't get my way, I can just throw garbage on the field, then it's going to start happening everywhere. Right. So, um, I don't know. Um, I've said, I've said my say a long winded response. Uh, Matt, let's start with you. What is your, what was your take on this game? Um, I need someone to explain to me why everybody in the conference looks sloppy as I'll get out. Um, nobody looks great. And I don't think either one of these teams, I mean, there were flashes of brilliance from UGA. There were flashes of brilliance from Texas that third quarter. They looked like they were about to climb back in this thing. Um, and just nobody looks good. I don't know what the problem is. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, we're so used to at least one or two teams being elite, top to bottom, for through the season. It's just we have not had that this season. Um, I, I kind of hate Quinn Ewers' is regressed. No, I don't want to say regress because that's not really the right word. He had a, he had a pretty rough night, um, you know. <sighs> and I also need you, Wes. You're going to have to explain this to me like I'm five. Uh, Carson Beck. You know how a couple years ago we were talking about quarterbacks and that term regression? Uh -huh. um, I feel like Carson Beck has taken some steps back. I was just looking at his stats from last year. Um, and last year, uh, he was at 73% for the season, almost 4,000 yards. He threw 24 touchdowns, six interceptions. So far this season, he's at 66%, so a couple points lower. Obviously, the yards aren't there because we've only played a couple games. Uh, he's thrown 15 touchdowns and eight interceptions. He's already thrown more interceptions in this season than in his previous three seasons combined. Um, and I don't know about you, but if that's my quarterback, I'm a little concerned. And I have to wonder about what's going on uh, in that particular regard. So that kind of makes me kind of go, maybe Georgia doesn't have the medal for this. Maybe there's going to be a bit of an issue going forward. I, again, I don't know if you could put that on the wide receiver core or if that's just a scheming issue. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, ATN, again, has to be the workhorse here. Almost 100 yards, three touchdowns, and four touchdowns, according to what you said. Um, it's. Uh, I'm wondering if the officiating crew from this game was the same one from the Tennessee game against Florida because they had the same issue with Dylan Sampson where he clearly scored, and then they called it back. Um, so where do we go from here? Texas has got one loss. Georgia has got one loss. Tennessee has got one loss. Ole Miss has got one loss. It's It's everybody's game at this point. And I think Georgia has a little bit of momentum going forward. It's just the question of how are they going to build on it? And Texas yeah. is going to have to to get right back at it next week. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a little bit of both. What you're talking about the the Beck struggles is um, I think that he obviously had a great season last year. He's trying to kind of maybe live up to the hype uh, to a certain extent, and then uh, but also there's been tons of drops. I mean, I think we had like nine or ten drops in that game alone. Uh, so, I mean, it's not all on him. Is some of it on him? Absolutely. But I mean, it, there's enough blame to go around. Jesse, what are you, what are your thoughts on this one? I, I mean, we're in a world right now where the only undefeated teams are Oregon, Penn State, Miami, Iowa State, <laughs> BYU, Indiana, how is Indiana undefeated? Make that stuff make sense. Pittsburgh. 
Navy. Army. Um, I love that the service academies are doing so well. Well, Army and Navy. <laughs> but yeah. I just, I just, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. You have three turnovers from Georgia. You have four from Texas. I've seen today that there are certain outlets asking why they didn't put Arch Manning in. They There's did. Just, and then he went like three for seven. <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying like why they didn't just stay with him instead of Ewers. Sark said he was just trying to calm Ewers down. So I think that was, yeah. I don't know, just going off what he said. <laughs> but who knows? Nothing, nothing makes Speaking sense. Of, nothing if, if I can interject real quick, Jesse, I did see something earlier where somebody posted a story about Quinn Ewers claiming a red shirt for the rest of the season and sitting out for the NFL draft. I did see that. It was deleted. I think it was a it was a barstool account. Mm. So take that with a grain of salt, but it's not like them to just make up random stuff. So no, a little bit of weird stuff. Know. going. This is just odd. Um, I, tr I truly don't know. I obviously didn't expect UGA to, to beat Texas, especially at home. It's a great win for them. Huge for their hopes of, you know, being taken seriously again and, and making sure that they are solidifying themselves. But I agree with what Matt said. This was sloppy football. I, been everyone cool. this week was super sloppy. Everybody's and there's sloppy. just not a really good identity in the SEC. Um, we used to be the like defensive juggernauts. Then we kind of had that change of like, holy cannoli, we're offense. And now it's like, we play football sometimes. <laughs> Here's a scary thought, guys. You know who has not looked sloppy? Who? Vanderbilt. Andy. Vanderbilt. I mean, they did lose to what Georgia sloppy. State, but still, that, that was that was years ago, Wes. It was <laughs> years ago. That. We don't. Nobody even makes that. that does it, no, that does not matter. Don't you? They're, don't you bring the hate on Vanderbilt? They're they ranked ball not in the hating, top man. twenty-five. They have a better record than Alabama does. And they have now the, yeah, well, not a better record than Bama. They have the same record as Bama, but it's with things that are weird. Very weird. Very weird. Speaking of, I, I, do, do we want to hang out anymore or, or are we going to move no. on? All right. Just... Speaking of weird, because you were talking about weird, this one was weird. Kentucky at Florida, Florida winning this one 48 to 20. Nobody gets the point here. Um, I was just stunned at Florida's demolition of Kentucky, all right? Uh, Kentucky losing the turnover battle here, turning it over three times. Although I know I know one of them was late by Cutter Bowley, their quarterback that they put in at the end there. Uh, and Florida uh, turning it over once. So, you know, uh, Florida winning that battle. But uh, what a performance by Jaden Ball, man. Over 100 yards on the ground and five, count them, five touchdowns for him in that game. So wild. Jesse, your thoughts on, on this one? I don't know where the team that gave Georgia a run for their money is um, in Kentucky, but they, they left a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, this was, this one was another weird one. And I think, yes, Kentucky's offense is still a mess, but this is a sign of regression for me. I think Stoops' program, if we look at it historically, we're seeing them move in the wrong direction. And that's not good. Like, yes, you can keep your job at Kentucky. If you're kind of mid, that's fine. But, like, this is not mid. The past three seasons, you know, we've started to see, like, every year just moving backwards. And they have a, a combined 25 and 25 record in SEC play from 2016 to 21. And now they've gone seven and 14 in the last three seasons in conference play, including a one and four mark thus far this season. That's not good. That's not going to save your job, even at Kentucky, uh, because right now Vanderbilt is far more successful than you are. And if we're looking at like the benchmark within the SEC, uh, not good, not good. Yeah. Coach soups. Uh, I would I would be nervous. Yeah. Matt, what'd you got? Uh, <laughs> make it make sense. Uh, this was a Florida team that we were convinced was going to win like two games in the SEC, and now they're sitting at two and two in the conference. I, I, it doesn't make 
any bloody sense. Florida confuses me. One week they look like they can't even put on their cleats right. The next week they look like they can hang 40 plus on somebody. Um, it's it just doesn't make sense. Maybe a lot of it has to do with this Jaden Ball kid that they've got come in. I just pulled up his stats from all the games through the last couple the, through this season. Against a he had one carry. Against Mississippi State, he had four carries. Against UCF, he had nine. Against Tennessee, he had 12. And then he had 22 touches against Kentucky. Um, it's obvious that um, Florida is going to want to lean on him, um, especially with a freshman quarterback. You're going to want to feed him the ball. And he's shown that he can make things happen when he does get the ball. Um, right now, he's averaging about 4.9 yards a carry, which is pretty good. So, again... They're going to have to lean on him going forward, and it's going to be something that's going to take some pressure off DJ Lagway. And DJ Lagway still averaged almost five yards of carry uh, in this game too. So Florida might be clicking at the right time. As far as Kentucky goes, <laughs> I don't know what's happening with Kentucky anymore. I've stopped trying to figure out what's going on with, with uh, Mark Stoops. I don't understand it. Um, and, you know, I, it's like I say every year, I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for Kentucky football. There are our, our, our friends to the north. I don't like them the week we play them, but any other week I'm okay with them. And I just, I don't understand why we're seeing this regression. Yeah, like Mark Stoops was like the name for head coaches in the SEC about who potentially who could take over the next big slot. And he's done nothing in the last two seasons with that. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a shame. I also would like to point out just a really weird stat that just pops out at me. DJ Lagway completed seven passes for 259 yards. Seven passes for that amount of yards. So it's obviously some chunk plays involved. So, uh, you know, kudos to, to him. That was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, let's move real quick through the last two uh, that were not really close. I had, uh, let's see, number eight LSU at Arkansas. LSU winning this one 34 to 10. I got the point, and then Ball State at Vanderbilt, Vandy winning this one, twenty-four to fourteen. Not super, not not a huge blowout, but we expected Vanderbilt to beat Ball State. Jesse got the point here. Now, do y'all have anything for those two before we move on? Vandy has to win one more game to get bowl eligible. Mm-hmm. It's something. If you had told me uh-huh. that Vandy could potentially be bowl eligible in October, mm-hmm. I'd have been like, "There's no friggin' way. You're lying. You're full of crap." But here we I'm are, ranked in the top here we twenty-five. Are. Here we are. And ranked in the top 25. Here we are. Um, all right, so pick on points. Jesse has 29. I've got 27, and Matt has 16. So we're still rolling right along. Got a lot of football left. Um, Winning something, finally. Let's let's do uh, helmet stickers. Matt, who are your helmet sticker recipients for this week? All right, for, my, for hel- my helmet stickers, which, by the way, we've got helmet stickers and stickers in general. You should check those out They're on their merch site. Wes is rocking the merch right now. <laughs> Show the people the t-shirt, Wes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's, there you go. Okay, thank you. There you go. Can't plug it if you won't show it, man. Yeah, man, it's um, here. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as helmet stickers go, uh, I think a helmet sticker for South Carolina's defense, nine sacks in their game against Oklahoma. If you're tackling the quarterback behind the line of scrimmage nine times, you've definitely done some good good work that day. And then uh, Caden Durham, 21 carries, 101 yards, three touchdowns on the day. Uh, in their win, so good day for him. That's who my other helmet sticker goes to. Jesse, your helmet stickers. UF, you all get a helmet sticker because <laughs> all of you. you 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 beat an SEC team and you beat them quite like quite well. So <laughs> good on you. And your starting quarterback's still not you know not there. So you know what, Gators, there's there's some signs of life for you. I don't think it saves Billy Napier's job, but. You get a helmet sticker. Uh, my it other one? Might. Mindy, you get a helmet sticker because, hey, you're almost bowl eligible. You have the same record as my team. You're ranked in the top 25. Nothing makes sense. So why not give you one? <laughs> this is all weird. Nothing makes sense. It's fine. Everything's Just, fine. just Jesse's channeling her inner kindergarten teacher with that voice. Did you hear that? It's <laughs> fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm going to give mine to, uh, and I could give it to the whole Georgia defense, but especially Jalen Walker, eight tackles, three sacks, one fumble recovery, and just really dominated this game. He was just all over the field, flying all over the field to the ball. Uh, and then Jaden Ball, as we just talked uh, about 106 yards on the ground for Florida at five touchdowns. Uh, pretty impressive uh, for the young man there. So um, let's uh, go ahead and get to our interview for the week. We have Will, uh, a Texas A&M fan, and we're excited to talk to him. 
All right. Well, we are incredibly excited to talk to Will Stone, host of the Ineligibles podcast, a podcast that covers Texas A&M and college football and a contributor to Good Bull Hunting, which focuses on Aggie football, basketball and baseball. Will, you are our first A&M guest. Welcome to the show. Well, that's 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 a great honor uh, to be the first A and M uh, guest on this on this show. So um, it's also great. I mean, I I first of all appreciate you guys having me on, um, and to be on with uh, well, I guess what I would call some of the old guard of the SEC: Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama. Um, it's it's pretty cool. So you know, I I love this stuff. I I can tell you guys love it too. So um, yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here. Yes, sir. I don't well, know if I love it right now. I'm not loving it right <laughs> now. You've loved it for the last 13 years. I, yeah, I, 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 I do want to point out that the A&M guy comes on and doesn't make himself off to be, how do I put this delicately? He's very accepting of the position in the conference, not like some of the other guests that we've had. I won't say name. <laughs> Um, are those, are those guests Texas. from schools, are they from schools maybe 90 miles to the west of the school Ooh, that I've been representing? Very possible. I think Matt's I'm, just, I'm even just giving them a hard time. I, I we, am, our, our Texas I am. guest they're, was they're very humble. People. So, great people. Great yeah. People. yeah. Um, so, uh, well, let's get right into it. So how did you become a Texas A&M fan? Yeah. So, um, it's, it's, it's a little unlikely, um, and maybe not how some, uh, a and graduates come to be so with I think with A and M like once like once someone goes there they kind of start like a family tradition of uh well and if you know A and M we're big on traditions but um <laughs> I feel like a lot of Aggies like it's just kind of it's a really big family thing and uh, like I didn't know I, I grew up uh the closest college to me was Baylor um which was a private school very expensive um and uh yeah I didn't have like my mom went to Sam Houston my dad went to welding school I didn't have any ties to any you know big big program but. Uh, when I was in first grade, my, my uh, teacher was an Aggie, um, and that kind of like was my first, uh, I guess, introduction to A&M. And uh, when I was little, I would get the paper every Sunday, and they'd put the scores with the helmets uh, on the top, and I would just kind of, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't even read at this point, but I'm looking at just at the helmets, and I'm like, oh, I like this helmet. You know, it's the A&M helmet. And uh, they were actually good when I was a, a child. Uh, they fell off as soon as I got into grade school, but um, so, so that part was rough. But uh, I say unlikely because when I was a kid, you know, I, I I will give myself credit for sticking to A and M. Like that was always my team, you know, number one. But Texas was really really good in that time period, and everyone at my school, every single person was a Texas fan, and mm -hmm. like wearing Texas gear, all that kind of stuff. It's not that way now, uh, but back then, man, I was I was a a, a, a very uh, small minority in and not just my town, but the state of Texas. And, um, uh, but as I got older, you know, I started looking at college and I'm like, man, like I, yeah, I rooted for this team and whatnot, but uh, is that a good fit for me for what I want to do with my, you know, with my life? And I was, I'm very, uh, uh, you know, lined up with, with kind of my personality and things like that. And, um, you know, once I got there, went on a visit, just fell in love even more. And, uh, you know, for the football aspect of this, I mean, I've, I, I love college football. Like, with a burning passion as you guys do. Um, and it's, it's so great. And just getting there and going to school there. And my first year stunk, we were six and six. Uh, we blew five first half leads, fired our coach. Um, the next year was great. Won the Heisman, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how it, it came to be. Um, I just, I picked a helmet I liked as a kid, uh, was loyal to it through and through. <laughs> um, I was telling my wife the other day, I think I, I, I have more emotions tied to a &M It's the one team that I chose. Like my parents chose like the Dallas teams for me. So I'm a Cowboys, Rangers, Mavericks, Stars. But I like this because my dad liked those. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had a I had a soft spot in my heart for the Cowboys when they had um back back after they were good in the nineties. So I, I, I get that. I get that. Yeah. Um this is yeah. Luca's MVP year. We're gonna call it right now and we're gonna yes. say out loud and proud. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. The, I, I'm not a huge hockey guy, but uh, my brother is the stars are five and one, I think. Um, they're a, a pretty solid franchise, but the Rangers finally won a world series with my second championship I've ever seen and, re and remembered. Cause I'm pretty sure the Cowboys won one, like the month I was born and then one other one. And then they've God. been completely mediocre ever since. So, um, and we know like, you know, just came up just short in baseball this year against, uh, against the volunteers. Um, and, uh, hopefully, you know, we get there on the football stage one day, but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my story. And, um, I've just gotten, uh, you know, I've just fallen more in love with, with A&M and, and college football, the, the older I've gotten and the more I've been in it. 
Very cool. And so I know uh, traditions are talked about a lot for A&M. Can you talk us through what are some Texas A&M traditions that we should be aware of? Just some of the big ones or however many you want to share. Yeah, so uh, I was actually trying to look at this earlier because we do have so many. I wanted to make sure I pointed out the uh, important ones because uh, there's a, a like on the a &M website, there's a section for traditions and you can spend hours <laughs> nice. just kind of going through them all <laughs> and whatnot. But um I think there's there's two sides to this. There's the the university side, which is, uh, you know, uh, very, very steeped in tradition. And of course, the football side, which uh, is is uh, the really fun part. It has plenty of, it, of, its, of its own traditions. But um, on the university side, uh, I think one of the big ones for me is uh, is muster um, on April 21st of each year, which I believe is the day that uh, Texas won its independence against uh, in the Battle of uh, San Jacinto. Uh, so we picked that day like, like 100 plus years ago to be like, uh, so once a year, we kind of gather, if you will. Uh, and there's a &M groups like, I guess, uh, a &M clubs, alumni clubs all over America and, of course, in Texas and uh, different counties and whatnot. And um, those counties will throw a like a muster like party on on that day. And it's really like it's 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 to get together. But the the, the, the main aspect of it is. Uh, to have a, a roll call for anyone that has passed that was, you know, in that county or part of that club. Uh, of course, the one in College Station is is huge. Um, I've been to that one a couple times when I was a student, but um, uh, there's usually pretty good speakers. Like I went to one in Dallas and uh, the speaker was Jackie Sherrill, our old football coach, which was great to listen to him. But um, I think that's cool to kind of, uh, you know, to like, like, even though we graduated, we go on to our lives, we still have this this bond and you know even if it's not all the time during football season of course but um there's still once a year where you can be like hey like this is you know like we're we're still aggies this is an AM thing and uh get together and uh and, and that sort of thing but um so muster i think is super cool um uh silver taps is one for uh for current students uh, that pass they have it once a month um it's a it's a big deal which i mean it's crazy to say because young people you know they have they, they they live a lot they, they, don't, they don't have high mortality rates but uh you know stuff happens and uh but there, there are some months even with you know seventy thousand students where there's no silver tax because because no one like no students pass that month which is always cool to see so um, i try to you know share that retweet that whenever the university puts that out so um but silver tap so, so once a week they'll gather on campus and I've, i'm blanking on what part but um so there's Everyone knows the taps like song with the bugle horn. Mm -hmm. Well, silver Ta silver taps is that same song, just slowed down quite a bit. Um, and there's like there's no one that even speaks or says anything. I, I actually I think someone reads off the names of the uh, of whoever passed that that month. Um, but that's all it is. It's that they play taps and everyone just kind of leaves. It's very somber, but it's very cool. Um, of course, bonfire. Everyone knows about that one. Um, I've this may make me, make me a bad Aggie. I've never actually been to Bonfire. It used to be on campus. Obviously, the tragedy back in in '99, and uh, now it's held like way out, kind of in the uh, in the country in in Brazos County. Uh, I've seen it. I've seen the live streams on Facebook and and YouTube, but I never have actually been. So uh, we'll definitely get to one because now we actually play Texas. So that was built around that game. Uh, so excited to get out to that, but. Um, on the football side, I mean, the biggest one is the 12th man, uh, which we just crossed. That was in 1922. So we just crossed the the century mark for that one. But um, so long story short, we were playing uh, center college in 1922. We're getting beat to hell with, with decimated with injuries. And, and our coach at the time was like, I might need to have someone from the stands come and suit up and and get in the game because we, we're down to 11 guys <laughs> and he's like we have one more injury like uh we're, we're gonna get penalized for having 10 guys so um, there's actually a basketball player by the name of e king gill who was uh the coach called him down he took an injured player's jersey and uniform and uh even though he never actually entered the game uh we did end up coming back and winning that game which was apparently a big upset i'm not sure if they had spreads back then but uh, that they, they say it was an upset um but uh so at, since then you know the the entire student section, which is uh, in Kyle Field, it's 38,000 uh, students. They stand up the whole game. Uh, luckily, we have 85, 105 kids now. Don't need to call anybody from the stands, hopefully. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, it, it is cool. And um, uh, you know, there's been different kind of lawsuits and things with that. Uh, like I know Seattle tried to 
uh, lay claim to it. And we, oh, yeah. we, 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 we kind of protected it. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not a lawyer. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, it's kind of one of those things where if you don't fight for it, you, it, you will lose it. And, and, uh, so I think Seattle is just focused on the number 12 instead of the 12th man. But, mm. um, so that's a big thing, obviously. But, but uh, the, the coolest thing with that, I think, was in, I think Jackie Sherrill is the best coach we've ever had uh, at AM. and um, We let, we let Texas run him off and put some uh, erroneous uh, infractions on him for paying players and whatnot, which that, that's all, you know, they, they should have just told the NCAA uh, where, where they can, where they can put that. But, uh, but Jackie Sherrill got here and, and kind of embraced the the culture of A&M. And he's like, man, some of these walk-ons are the, are the, meanest and most fearless players on our team so he would comprise the entire kickoff team of solely walk-ons and uh that was like the 12th man kickoff team and uh they kind of had a reputation of just going down there you know this is pre-targeting so they're just knocking the crap out of people and, <laughs> and that sort of thing so so now um uh now the the, the the number 12 will get awarded to uh the top walk-on on the team um I think Elko lets the players uh, vote on it now. So, um, but since I've been following, um, cause a friend asked me this, he was like, like who, who gets the number 12? Like who decides that? And I'm like, it's always, you know, a walk on who's a pretty good special teams player. And I think for a while, I think maybe the last one didn't, but I think every 12th man we had for like 12 or 13 years blocked a kick at some point. And, um, and it was the same, like, it'd be the same guys for like, you know, three or four years, but I, I can name five of them that, that block kicks when I was there and like and mm -hmm. a little bit after. So, um, uh, I, I don't, our, our last one didn't block a kick, but he, he had to play in the Texas bowl cause we had 50 players and, uh, he got an interception in the Texas bowl. So I guess that's just as good as getting a, as getting a block kick. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, that's, that's the primary ones I, I would say. Um, this isn't really a tradition that's like, you know, widely known, but, my favorite thing is on game day at Kyle Field, and when we entrance, like our entrance is, uh, it's the drum line, and like the towels are going like this to the beat of the drum. They're all in sync, and uh, that leads into power, of course, by by Kanye West, which we've adopted over the last decade. So um, that that part gives me chills every time. It's completely electric, and uh, it's 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 very cool to see. So um, I don't know if you guys have been to Kyle Field for a game, but if you haven't, uh, it's 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 quite a sight. So. Um, I know that that was a pretty long winded answer, but I, I, I didn't even scratch the surface on how many traditions we actually have. So <laughs> I tried to hit. No, the you're, ones. you're good. One thing that I did want to ask about real quick though, is I know that the midnight yell is another kind of famous yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been present for one of those? And if so, what was that like? For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely more so of a, uh, uh, freshman type thing. Um, as you get older and your legal drinking age, you, you probably tend to be at the bar at midnight and not, uh, <laughs> not, not, at, not at yell practice, but, um, uh, it, it is really like my, my wife has not been to one. Uh, she actually went to a, a different school that's in Texas, but, uh, she does, she does root for us now. And, um, I need to get her to one cause, uh, it, it, it is cool. And to see, um, you know, that many people show up the, the day before a game, like it's been as many as like in the 40, you know, 40,000 range. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, trust me i i get it. it it is silly if you if you're not in person you see clips up you're like this is the stupidest thing i've ever seen <laughs> but uh but you see in a person like okay these jokes are supposed to be dumb and uh like they're not like these aren't serious like burns on the other team they're just you know, it's just kind of dumb but uh it, it is cool to go to and uh you know if if you're in town for a game and you have the time i certainly you know i try to make it out there sure yeah um, what are, so on game day, what are some key, like go-to spots where people just have to visit, uh, you know, whether they're just, you know, hanging out and watching the game or before or after the game or some good spots? Yeah. So, um, it's, you know, it, our, our enrollment has gotten, uh, so large and the population has gotten so great in college station that places are absolutely packed on, like, and they always have been, but, like I, I, it's just getting worse and worse with the just amount of people that are there, especially a big game like Notre Dame. Like mm -hmm. you, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't getting cell phone service that day. Like there's just too many phones in one place to, to get any signal, but, um, and, and bars of course are packed, but, uh, if, if you're in town for a game, uh, you have to at least go to the Dixie chicken and, and, and order a pitcher, um, play some dominoes. That's, uh, you know, it's been around since I think the seventies 
it's 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 our it's our iconic you know college bar uh they play great you know country music it's uh they probably haven't changed out the the floors since they built it <laughs> <laughs> you know the the the, the, the urinals are full of ice and um uh they, they got good food and and good music and there's names and whatnot carved into the the tables and walls and all that sort of stuff so it, it's certainly a, a a cool a cool place to to hang out um if you're watching the game so like there's, there's a place called chimmy's all my buddies go i don't like to go there it's a bit of a younger crowd i'm in my 30s now um i don't want to stand i don't first of all i, I don't want to stand the entire time uh, if I'm not actually in the stadium, <laughs> I'd like to sit down and order a drink, but, right. uh, and, and I, I don't want to wait an hour for, uh, for a drink and then have to get right back in line. So, right. um, but, uh, th there's a place called the spot, um, that just opened up. That's, uh, that's a little bit smaller, but it's a nice place. Uh, the backyard is a, a bigger place. It's got a big outside area, two story inside, lots of TV, stuff like that for game days. Um, and, uh, there's, there's, Believe it or not, with a, a school like AM, there is a little club scene on a certain part of Northgate that uh, that's your vibe. You know, you can pop in there and uh, uh, order a bottle of, of champagne or or, or uh, and uh, get down to to whatever music you like. But uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the bar scene for food. Man, I, I'm I'm a sucker for wings and more. Um, it's 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 not even like it's not the best food you're ever gonna have. But like the they serve beer in 34 ounce, you know basically frozen glasses uh the the wings are awesome the tenders are awesome the fries are awesome uh, it's comfort food. great home <laughs> yeah for sure great homemade <laughs> ranch um if you're if you're stopping through quick i would get lane's chicken fingers it's uh the um it's the i guess the the smaller much smaller competitor to, to canes raisin canes mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's the exact same thing just cooked a little bit differently um so, same kind of sauce, a little bit, just a little bit different taste. But um, I've always been a big Lanes and Wings and More guy. But uh, yeah, and at the chicken, uh, definitely get a hamburger and get Tijuana fries with uh, some some jalapenos. But um, and uh, and of course, get a get a, a big pitcher of beer while you're there. Of course, yeah, always. Um, so talk to us about your podcast, the Ineligibles podcast. How did that come about? And then kind of a follow up to that: How did you become a contributor to uh, Good Bull Hunting? Yeah, so um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like once I got to A and M, uh, well, like first of all, like, like we were supposed to be good that year, like we were preseason top ten, uh, you know, go figure, didn't live up to that, but uh, like I remember because because we had been like six and six the year before, but we were bringing back uh, Ryan Tannehill, uh, uh, Cyrus Gray, Kristen Michael, um, Sean Porter on defense was a really good player for us, um, and. Uh, like I said before, like we were in all of those games and like, you know, I remember the, the heartbreak of Arkansas coming back on us in Jerry world with, with Petrino and like uh, Justin Blackman just going off on us in the second half against Oklahoma state. And like, even though I, I hated all that, like I, I still like, I, I, I loved going to games. I loved the football. Like I loved the sport and the craziness of it. And um, that my freshman year was our very first coaching search as we fired Sherman uh, ended up hiring Kevin Sumlin um, I joined, uh, uh, tech Sags, you know, very famous message board for A&M, uh, been a member on there ever since, but, uh, being able to engage with that kind of community, I'm like, this is super freaking cool. And like, um, amongst my friends, I was like, you know, the football, like nerd guy, like if they had a football question, they'd be like, Hey, like, like, Will, like, what do you think about this? You know? And, uh, like, what well, this prospect or this player, like, you know, like that sort of thing. So, um, that, that was kind of my, you know, reputation. And, uh, when I was a sophomore and junior, I worked, uh, for the radio station, which produces, uh, text tax radio. So I uh, got to work with some of those guys for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, I remember, um, I was actually on a, a much smaller, uh, or like a kind of an upstart, uh, network that was trying to make different podcasts for different schools. And, um, I had, uh, had like a little weekly thing on there, but that was 2014. And, um, uh, uh Jesse, I'm sure you remember this, but, uh, Bama beat us 59 to nothing uh, in that, in that game and it, like completely crushed. Like, I'm like, man, I'm so glad that this is not my full-time job that I don't have to get up on Monday and go talk about this awful <laughs> performance. So, um, since then it's, it's something like I graduated, like I got a, you know, a, a real job and I've worked in the corporate world and whatnot, but, um, uh, I still follow this, you know, as close as ever. And, um, uh, some buddies of mine were like, Hey, like, um, you know, like you should do a podcast or, or, you know, like, uh, 
like my buddy Chase and I, like he, he was on the equipment team. Um, we were in school and, um, you know, he had a really great passion for it. So, um, like I, I really have to credit him for like kind of staying on me and like, uh, convincing me to pull the trigger. Cause I was like, man, like no one gives a crap what I have to say. <laughs> like, why, like, why would I ever do that? <laughs> but, uh, we, we, we did it just to have fun and just to hang, honestly, just to hang out once a week and, and just kind of, you know, uh, just catch up and, and talk football. But, uh, I, I, I got associated with good bull hunting through uh, Robert Barron's, who's the, the managing editor there. And, um, he, he, if you, if you follow him at all, he, he's a Photoshop wizard. And, uh, when we were trying to come up with a logo, I sent him a message. I was like, Hey, like, you know, my name is Will. I'm trying to start this in podcast. Um, I don't know anything about Photoshop, but if, uh, you could like tour around with the logo for us, like this is our name and, um, and see what you can come up with. And, um, yeah, that kind of started our relationship. And, uh, you know, after a little while, got him on the show as a guest and, um, uh, good bull hunting when I was in college, they had probably 12 writers that were there at least, or 12 contributors, I would say. And they would have, you know, weekly like round table articles and things like that. And those guys all, you know, kind of grew up and, you know, had families, didn't have the time. And Robert was kind of the only guy left. And, uh, I had a, you know, a passion for writing. I, I actually went and built a whole blog website for the ineligibles. And I was like, why am I doing this? I can just message Robert and see if I can write for them. You know, they already have it. It's like they already have it built out and everything. So, uh, he was very receptive and, you know, I did a little bit last year with, uh, some film breakdowns. And, um, after this past season, he was like, Hey, like, we have a guy that's kind of taking a step back. Would you like to be a, a bigger contributor, you know, with some, uh, some breaking news type stuff and maybe some, some more longer form content. And I said, absolutely. So, um, I've been doing that for, you know, this season, uh, helped out with the baseball coverage, uh, back in the spring when, uh, the postseason was, was, was rolling. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a great, I think it's a great situation for me to, uh, to have a creative outlet for, you know, this great passion of mine. And, um, uh, super fortunate for Robert and for Chase both, but uh, you know, with with Good Bull Hunting giving me a, a way bigger audience than I ever would have got before, and uh, you know, I, what I always tell Robert, I was like, even just putting Good Bull Hunting in my in my bio on Twitter, I can I can go to guests, you know, potential guests, and be like, hey, I'm with this thing that you've actually heard of, and not this you know random blog that no that no one knows about, and uh, <laughs> you know, I've I've gotten some, some decent guests out of the deal and. Yeah. Uh, it's it's been great so um, I'm, I'm very very thankful for the, the the situation that i'm in and real quick just for any viewers who may not know uh we know because uh, we've done our research right and everything but what is the phrase uh good bowl what does that mean for non-aggie people yeah so um i was actually i figured this would come up because I, I tried to go look it up uh beforehand because it is on our website and there's not really a good origin story of what of where it comes from uh, just that it means like, Hey, like, like good, like good stuff, you know, like, uh, right. Like, it's kind of like a positive, like, you know, uh, agreement type thing. Like, Oh, like if you like, say you go, you know, do, do a good deed, like, Oh, that, that's, 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 that's good bull. You know, like, uh, mm -hmm. um, like whenever there's some kind of like, uh, you know, uh, like someone loses their Aggie ring, you know, like it's got our names on the inside, uh, you know, they'll share it out post like, Oh, that's, that's good bull, you know, helping someone find their, their stuff or, you know, contributing to a, you know, charity, go find me that type of thing. But good bull just means like, Hey, like, like good on you and, and that kind of thing. But I have no clue where good bull, like, <laughs> like, like where, like where, like where it came from, who even right. came up with it. But, but that's kind of what it means. I have, I have this mental picture of a cowboy pet, petting another guy on the head. Good, like, good bull. Yeah. Good bull. <laughs> that's, that's a mental picture. That is, that's that good. screams, that screams Texas. Like it just screams it. So and it's, it screams A&M. Yeah, so that, that's, I, it's I, very likely I, that that's how it happened. I, I have a, I have a coworker that that he grew up in, outside of Dallas, so I'm about to text him and ask him if he knows about it. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, here's here's a fun one. So, who is your favorite Texas A&M player, past or present? Yeah. So I I think a lot of people would say Johnny, which I think is kind of a cop out answer. Like, obviously, we all love Johnny. He won a Heisman. He was incredibly fun to watch. Um, but for me, I, I I think I've said it on my show a time or two, but um. My personal favorite is Anaya Smith. Um, mm. There's there, there's not a guy that I can think that whenever he was out there, uh, I knew for a fact he was going to give 100 percent effort um, and and played football like because because in, in high school he did everything. He was you know receiver, running back, corner, safety, quarterback. Um, played offense for us. Played running back, receiver. Could have played defense if we asked him to. Um, and just a a gritty, high energy, you know, spark plug of a player. 
Uh, loved a &M, never once, you know, you know, bother with the transfer portal, that type of thing. And uh, which, I mean, I mean, kids that do like, no, like there's no issue with that, but um, he was, uh, was locked in, you know, hundred percent as soon as he got here and, um, and uh, you know, breaking his leg, coming back in, in, in for his, his fifth year. Um, and then even in the bowl game last year, was injured. He was like, I can't suit up and play but he acted as our receivers coach for that game. Like, you know, he's like, he could have been off doing draft stuff, you know, working out, rehabbing, whatever else. He's like, nope, I want to be with the team. I want to help uh, whatever way I can. So um, uh, love Johnny, love Mike Evans, love Miles Garrett. Uh, but if I'm picking one guy, it's got to be a nice Smith. Okay. All right. Now we're getting into some really fun ones now. So who, all right, let's go. Yeah. Who would you consider to be Texas A&M's biggest rival and give us your unfiltered thoughts on them? Yeah, um, I don't think the word I'm going to say is is truly a cuss word. So, it, um, <laughs> be, I already love where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure this is a this is a family friendly show, and, uh, and I, if you, uh, it may if, not be this week. We, it may not be. It's, it's fine. <laughs> it we've, we've, we've had to my mom them. listens. It's fine. Go ahead. Yeah, we've had to mark this word before. It's 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 fine. This word isn't that bad, but uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely Texas. Um, uh, anyone that like any A&M fan that would argue otherwise is uh is kind of fooling themselves like Texas is, is by by far our biggest rival um what I think about them unfiltered is uh they are arrogant pricks and not all, <laughs> not all of them not 100 percent of them but uh and, and my brother and some other of my friends are like man like like why do you hate Texas so much like you know A&M brainwash you blah 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 and uh I'm like I'm like you don't understand how their fans are. He's like, everyone's got bad fans. I'm like, every, yes, everyone has them, but they're a small percentage. Like there is something institutional about that university that just breeds that type of mentality. Um, and I've had well, great well, interaction. Let me, let me interrupt you real quick. Well, I think you're mispronouncing it. It's not Texas. It's Georgia. Georgia's <laughs> oh, <come> on. Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we just got done playing Texas, so I, I can kind of yes. Thank Wes, you. By the way, I don't want to hear, you it. Don't wanna hear it. <laughs> yes, uh, very, very right, thankful. That the, you're good. You're good. No, I'm very glad the dogs pulled that off on on Saturday. Even if it would have helped a And M, if Georgia had a second loss, I don't even care. Uh, I will <laughs> never pull for Texas to win a game. But um, but like back in the uh, the late the late Big Twelve, you know, stage. Um, Things were kind of falling apart. Uh, revenue was not. Uh, it was all going to Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, and Texas A&M was was third, you know, amongst the distribution, which was was fine. Um, but when things were getting unstable and and you know TV networks were starting to be a, a bigger thing, um, you have Nebraska and Colorado uh, both leave and go to the Pac-12 or Nebraska to the Big Ten, Colorado to the Big Twelve, and uh, we have a, a a brand new president of the school and. Uh, like it's kind of a wild story because like he was a, a physics professor at AM Galveston and like never had aspirations of being the president at AM. And we had so much internal internal turmoil, he just kind of lucked his way into it. And he gets there and the the everything's falling apart around him. <laughs> like um and he's like, Hey, you know, he goes to the guy at Texas Bill Powers, he's like, Hey, we're looking at our options and this is what we think. What, like, like, what do you guys think? And uh, they kind of like tried to, uh, you know, big brother us and be like, hey, don't worry, we got this. It's all going to work out. And we're like, no, you don't got this. And what you want may not be what we want. And what they wanted back then, how crazy would this be, was to go make a Pac-16 with A&M, Oklahoma, Texas, and Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. And along with, you know, Colorado and maybe one other school that was already uh, was already headed that way. And we were like, we don't want to do that. Like, we don't like, like our fan base, we sent out an email. We're like, nobody wants to go to the Pac-12 at all. <laughs> so we're not doing that, period. And uh, they kind of just tried to, you know, uh, hold meetings without us and kind of speak for us. And we're like, we're not doing that. Uh, and like, I think after that kind of got out, they go create the Longhorn Network it, like for the purpose of showcasing high school recruits games on it. And mm -hmm. uh, we're like, nope, we're, we're not even going to even mess with this uh, anymore so uh, we joined the sec and and people would would rag on me sometimes when we would lose to you know and and go eight and four or whatever else in the sec i'm like i i really don't care i mean like uh not that eight and four is great 
good or acceptable by any means, but uh, looking back, it was the best movie we could have ever made because of the way it is now. You know, if 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 things say we if we stay, I'm not positive that Texas would like would vote for us to join them in the SEC, and they may, may try to leave us out. But um, and and I, I used to kind of justify it with like you know they had Bill Powers and Dallas Dots was their AD. I'm like maybe it was just those two guys were just kind of you know just kind of arrogant and dumb. But you see it with Chris Del Conte, their current AD, uh, same exact attitude, same mentality. Um, and, and I've had perfectly pleasant conversations with like, like my cousin went there and we can we can talk about football in a non, you know, hostile, you know, level, you know, non hostile conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm on a show tomorrow night that's hosted by a, a Texas Longhorn. But um, you see the ones on, on on Twitter and, you know, 95 percent of the ones in your replies are just. Uh, some of the worst people uh, in in the state of Texas. So uh, that's that's kind of how I feel about them. There's so much Texas tea. <laughs> there really is. <laughs> and, I didn't know. But, but tell you can't say that it's not on brand. Like I mean, look at. I mean, it makes the, sense. The general right. idea about it. I mean, di- yeah. you Look at the show Dallas. That you put it with the cut with a football paint a coat a coat of paint, and then you yeah. have you have the relationship between Texas and Texas. And, and Will, I have to ask, because we even talked about this on the show, but obviously um, A&M joined the SEC. When Texas made the decision to join, were A&M fans really mad about that? I mean, it seemed like it wouldn't go over well. <laughs> yeah, I think for about 48 hours, I was, uh, I think everyone was was pretty upset about it because uh, it, it was a big, you know, it was a big negative for them to be in the Big 12. Mm-hmm. Um Obviously, they're not hurting for money by any means, but right. uh, if you look at some of their home schedules, like they play OU in Dallas every year. If it's a year where they where they travel to a big out of conference team, they're playing Iowa State and Texas Tech at home, <laughs> right. and those are the big games. Or Kansas right. State, you know, and uh, and good good football teams, and and they they would lose to those teams sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so different now. Like uh, you know, th- I think the new SEC is like the the English Premier League in soccer, where it's just so many like good you know brands and 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 programs and i mean look at it right now like who the heck's going to win this thing um so uh <laughs> at, at first, at, at first I, <laughs> no we idea just, we don't know <laughs> we have no freaking clue <laughs> yeah so at first i was like man like that sucks you know th- that was kind of you know we always had one up because they were in a in a in a crappy conference and we were in a great conference but uh now that they're here i'm like man like it's on you know i'm so glad i'm glad they're here uh I cannot wait for that game on November 30th. And who would have thought, I mean, it's still, you know, four games away for, for, for us, but that's a game that could have some big implications uh, oh, at, yeah. the, at the end of the regular season. For sure. All right. And and maybe this goes hand in hand with that, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, but who would you consider who's the best fan base you've interacted with? And then by contrast, who's, who's the worst? Uh, so <laughs> I thought about the best and my answer, I, I, don't, I think all three of you are not going to like this team. Uh, and I, so I've, I've been to Athens, I've been to Knoxville. Um, I've not yet made it out to Tuscaloosa. Um, but my trips to, to Georgia and Tennessee were, were perfectly fine. Uh, we had a great time and nice fans and all that, but the nicest people were Auburn. Um, and maybe that's because we're not Bama or Georgia fans because they hate you guys. <laughs> we they got nothing against I remember, us. Yeah, I remember being in the like being in the uh, like in the stadium as the game starts, and every highlight is a game against Georgia or a game against Alabama. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, they're probably excited like to play us, but man, like they, all they have is the kick six and Cam Newton. That's, that's it. Oh, come on, Jesse. <laughs> let them have, let them, let them have, let them enjoy themselves. I, I went to Auburn one time for a game and they were, they were nice. They were nice during the, uh, before the game, during the game, a couple of drunk people yelled at me after the game, but you know, they were drunk, whatever. I'm not going to yeah. complain about Auburn fans too they're much. They're fine. Their fans are fine. Honestly, for the most part, they're fine. I don't actually yeah. have like a huge issue with them. When they come to campus or when we go to campus, it's one of those things where we've done it a million times. Yeah. It's fine. And it really is kind of like a brother situation where we, we're we going to jaw at each other. But at the end of the day, if we can keep a championship within the state of Alabama, we're going to brag about it. Mm-hmm, and right. when something happens within our state 
I do think our programs really come together. And I think we've shown that on several occasions when we've had necessity to come together as a state um, due to natural disaster or, or whatever it may be. So I, yes, we go at each other for sure. We're all so sick of seeing that stupid kick six. Um, but I think we also recognize as fan bases that we bring the best play out of each other because no matter that's true. who's bad, who's that, that's, really that's good, for sure. that game, Iron Bowl is insane. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Auburn could win or could lose every game this season. And they still will probably, you know, give us a run for our money, even if we were undefeated. So I'll, I'll give them that. I'm not going to hate on them too much. They're not my least favorite fans. I'll say that. <laughs> All right. Well, who's, who's the weird. worst? Yeah. So, um, do you want worst SEC or, or worst overall? Just in general. Okay. Um, cause I, so, but so also, I, I kind Will's, of Will's going to come out yeah. of the woodwork and play like SMU both. or something. <laughs> Hold on. If they're different answers, I want both. I, yeah, the, I think the, our the, the answer with, with like uh, Virginia Tech or something. So, it, you, you know, that's whatever. funny. Yeah, that's a good point. It's going to be like Harvard. It's the, the answer. Yeah. The, yeah. Also arrogant. <laughs> um, but no, so I've like, since I've been graduated, I've, I've been lucky enough to go to to a few different places you know athens knoxville i've been to clemson i've been to auburn um interact with arkansas arkansas fans at jerry world every year um my least favorite sec is is probably ole miss um i went there a couple times when i was in college uh and you know i especially one year i i, I probably acted a fool at the game um but i remember like some of the comments made like in a game we won, by the way, like some of the comments were like, oh, like y'all couldn't get into Texas and like, like all this kind of, you know, other kind of stuff. And uh, like Ole Miss is not a academic institution at all. Um, so. <laughs> the person to say that to think in a row. Uh, yeah. I yes. love it. I love it how when we have people on, Ole Miss catches strays. We had an right. LSU like fan it's... on last week. He said the same Ooh, thing. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and obviously like every, every fan base, especially on, on the hellscape of this Twitter, uh, is going to have a couple of, of bad apples, but, oh, yeah. uh, and the, the worst overall, it, it's probably going to surprise folks, but, and this is, this is pre, like, this is before they have the coach that they have now, but it's Colorado, um, in, in 2021. Really? So, so we, we had a home and home with them. It, when it was supposed to be here, it was canceled due to COVID. And then the next year to compromise, we played them at the Broncos stadium in Denver. Mm. And uh, I was like, this is going to be great. going to be great weather. You'll get out of the Texas heat in September, which it was still pretty hot up there. Um, but uh, like, yeah, like, like we were all excited for the trip to Denver. Like I'm sure these, these, these Colorado fans, like they're not good at football. They're not going to care. Like they're going to be welcoming and whatnot. Those people talked more trash than you would believe <laughs> for a team that was one, one and 11 the year before. Oh. <laughs> and like, oh, like man. even after the game and like, uh, there was uh, some some people that we were with that sat in a different section, and th- their section was kind of uh, next to uh, the Colorado students, and they're like throwing like half empty beer bottle or like beer cans like in our in our section, and uh, and and like they had to, like and not that they were aiming for kids, but like like our our friends had their kids with them, and I'm like you know, there's so much like from that weekend that put a bad taste in my mouth about their fans i cannot imagine how they act now oh gosh. with uh with their current situation their fans but, on uh, twitter are a hot mess i know that but yeah i'm yeah. just gonna blame so. the lack of oxygen in the air <laughs> that's gotta be it <laughs> but you would think living in a beautiful place like colorado right. and boulder like you would think yeah oh i'm good with everything man everything's lovely but apparently not apparently not. Yeah. west when we post this on social media you better tag every single barstool colorado thing absolutely and- I'm, and you will get you will get, you will get so Just much tag Dion. Go, go ahead. what do they what do they call that in uh it's uh uh oh is it rage baiting uh, yes engagement <laughs> farming that's that's yeah. what I was looking at. <laughs> yes. If you if you tag Dion he'll ban me from their press their press conferences. There so. you go. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um it's right. just, notice Jesse's not saying a word right now. <laughs> So let's um let's move it back to uh, the coaching staff for A and M. Obviously, you got a new coach in uh, Mike Elko. So let's use the traditional grading method A through F. Uh, how would you 
grade the job that he has done thus far in his first season as head coach? I think I think thus far it has to be an A. Um, and there's uh, there's several different reasons, and uh, it, you know that that could that could change you know, by the way the rest of the season goes. But um, I think he's shown he's shown a lot already that uh, if if he can sustain it, it'll be. Uh, uh, a pretty special time to be an a and fan. Um, so I, I thought about this question earlier. So I, first of all, I appreciate you sending me the stuff prior so I can kind of organize my thoughts on this. But, I'm a planner. Um, I, I like to be prepared. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Elko was, was extremely beloved by the a fan base when he was our defensive coordinator uh, here for four seasons under Jimbo Fisher. Um, and that, that was, was kind of the first sign to me that something may be off with, with Jimbo because he was an offensive guy, right? And Elko gets here and immediately turns our run defense around. Like we, we were not a very talented team at that time. We were below the blue chip, you know, 50% ratio. Um, and immediately we have like the third best run defense in the country. Secondary, not so great, but more due to the fact of, of personnel than anything else. Um, and the defense was great for four seasons and the offense was just kind of up and down. And I'm like, uh, this is great and all, but why isn't our offense not, improving or, or, or showing what the defense is and then Elko leaves and things really fall apart for AM. and um and so he left he left and our strength coach went back to Oklahoma Jerry Schmidt um we promoted from within that didn't go well uh the the foundation was already already had cracks and eventually the Jimbo Fisher era uh just completely crumbled at AM. and whenever Elko left we all had eyes on him at Duke just out of curiosity, like not that he would go and set the world on fire, which he kind of did for Duke, Duke standards. Um, you know, win, winning nine games his first year, uh, you know, getting to a bowl game, beating UCF, uh, seven and five the year following, almost beats Notre Dame. Uh, if his quarterback, you know, doesn't get hurt, maybe they pull it off. Um, and even like with a banged up quarterback, I think they got down to their third string guy, you know, that season and still pulled out seven and five, played a lot of close games. And uh, it was just super impressive the way that Duke played. And I'll say this when, when we on Thanksgiving of last year, we were exhausted as a fan base. Uh, we'd already fired Jimbo a few weeks prior. We we're in this coaching search and I go to bed on Saturday and it's like, Hey, Mark Stoops is the guy. That's who we're hiring. And we're like, what the F, you know? <laughs> and uh, so like I'm on Twitter for a little bit and there's some stuff out there. I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to go to bed. I can't take any more of this. Like you're about to pull a Tennessee we... Greg Shiano hired. <laughs> thing. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Hey, we, we don't talk about that anymore. All right. We moved yeah. on. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, so, so that would have been an F for me if we had hired Mark Stoops. Um, I'll wake up and like, they're like, Hey, this isn't the case. Our AD kind of like uh, tried to pull a fast one on our, our, our regents. And uh, so that doesn't go through shortly after Mike Elko is announced. I think he had flown at, in at like 4 a.m. Uh, that morning uh, to uh, accept the job and whatnot. And my thought then was I was like, we may never win the whole thing with Elko. And maybe the thing with Jimbo was the, the talent acquisition. Like he was a, an elite recruiter, at least from a, uh, a pure talent standpoint, maybe not a character or scheme fit standpoint or even roster management going after the right positions. But when it came to getting the big, the heavy hitters on signing day, he, he could, he could close. Um, I'm like, I'm not sure if Elko will ever sign, you know, a top two or three class here, but he can sign some top tens. He, he can have us playing sound, good football. We're always going to have good defense. And you know what? Maybe we break through one year, but uh, he really hit the ground running in the transfer portal, like right off the bat. And we needed it in a bad way. Uh, yeah. We played our bowl game with, with, you know, I think like 55 players, um, a lot of freshmen, a lot of walk-ons out there um, was, we almost, we almost won that game with our fourth string quarterback who had to come in the second play of the game. Um, but he goes out and signs seven defensive backs, which we desperately needed uh, maybe lands the best player in the whole transfer portal last year. Nick Scorton, uh, who has played extremely well so far this season, uh, gets some linebackers, gets some uh, receivers, uh, brought in two offensive linemen that are currently starting for a, a really good unit up front for us. Um, and recruiting, I think he's got a top 10 class by the composite rankings right now. And uh, and so that part looks good. I think he's he's set up to do pretty well with uh, with next year's class. But I think he understands the the organization aspect of it, of running a football program at this level. Um, and he delegates so much. He's got a guy for, you know, for – just transfer portal scouting for just high school scouting. He's got a, 
He's got a general manager, you know, that oversees all of it um, and that sort of thing. He's very in tune with the need for NIL and trying to get that, you know, going a little bit more here. Um, but also like his coaching hires really impressed me when he first got here. Uh, obviously Colin Klein, I was uh, really excited by that one. Um, I didn't think he would leave his alma mater and uh, I figured he would just stay there until he was the next head coach at Kansas state, which he may be down the line. But uh, I know other teams have tried to hire him. Notre Dame wanted him. Penn state wanted him. We were able to pull him. Thankfully uh, brought his online coach from Duke who has done Fantastic for us this season. Love him. Uh, I thought going out to get Holman Wiggins from Alabama uh, when Nick Saban was still employed at that time was a huge, a huge kid. Um, and I think he, he takes a little bit too much heat from our program. That's a different thing. I think he's still uh, working to get us some some better receivers. Um, but uh, so I liked his coaching hires. I liked his recruiting, his transfer class. And not just the, like his X's and O's is very, very good. Um, but I think what AM has lacked for so long is – a guy that is a leader of men and Nick Saban was that for Alabama for so long, like a true, like great leader for these kids. Uh, we have not had that in a long time. Uh, Kevin, someone was not that Jimbo Fisher was not that uh, Elko's getting talented guys. He's getting the right guys. And, you know, I think they're taking on his mentality of, you know, blue collar, you know, hardworking type team. And uh, it's very exciting. And look like we could finish this year eight and four for all I know which would not be the end of the world if we did. But um, in a couple of years, it, when he is truly, you know, entrenched and everything is built, you know, at this, at this, at this program, uh, it could be something to be reckoned with. And, um, you know, as of right now, I, I think I'd, he'd pass with flying colors if, if, I, if I'm getting him a grade. Yeah. I have to ask, and this is not on the sheet. So Wes is a planner. I'm an agent of chaos. Um <laughs> But you mentioned both Kevin Sumlin and Jimbo Fisher, and we talked a lot about them the past couple seasons, comparing them, right? Because before Jimbo left, he was brought in as this quarterback whisperer, this offensive mind, this great recruiter. It was going to be a really new era for a and But if you look at their records, very eerily similar by like two game difference. So what are your thoughts as a fan, um, someone who was there during the Sumlin years, that this comparison, they were pretty similar, but Jimbo's yeah. out was huge. So number one, how did he last that long? Because <laughs> um, you're paying him out anyways. Yeah. And um, yeah, what are your your thoughts on that comparison? So the it's something that, that we hated as fans because especially at first, like Kevin Sumlin's first year was with Johnny Manziel and an NFL offensive line and Mike Evans and Ryan Swope and they won 11 games that year. And that always kind of tilted the scale in someone's favor, you know, those first couple of years. Um, and, and Jimbo's second year, we played the number one team three different times. Uh, Auburn was in the top, you know, eight that year was a very good team. Yep. And, uh, and obviously LSU Clemson, Alabama were all great. Um, but uh I, I think a, a lot, a lot, what, what, so what happened to AM is uh, going into 2020, uh, we had a pretty manageable schedule. It was the third year of Jimbo. He was recruiting at a, a pretty good clip, um, but we had just gone seven and, or I guess eight and five the year before. And uh, we're like, hey, we need to really see something this year. And then it was the COVID season and things kind of got, you know, screwed around a little bit. Um, but him winning that Florida game set up a lot of things, you know, that, was ultimately our detriment. First thing was, I think after that kind of game, he's like, Oh, my offense does work, you know? And he's like, I don't need to change. Like, I'm just going to stick with it. And I, I obviously all, all the fans bought him because that, that was a, a really good team. It was not a great team. Uh, if they had made the playoff, they very unlikely that they would have won the whole thing. Bam was on a very different level than everybody else that year. Um, but that was enough for the fan base to, you know, kind of go all in on Jimbo Fisher um, and at that point, LSU was kind of faltering a little bit and we were like, Hey, our old AD that was here that hired Jimbo, they're good buddies. Now he's at LSU. They might try to come after him. We need to extend him now to, uh, to keep that from happening, which is a very A&M thing to do. And was, uh, the wrong at that point was, it looked like, Hey, this is the right thing to do. We can't let LSU take our coach. Like that would make us look horrible, but now we did that. LSU has a really good coach, and we have this guy that we're paying 
uh, Milton not coach here anymore. So um, between him and Sumlin, like uh, the difference was that Jimbo could bring in the best of the best player. He could go heads up with a, a Bama, Georgia, or Ohio State and land a five-star defensive lineman, but he couldn't, you know, maintain a culture. He couldn't coach an offense. And ultimately that led to losing a lot of games that we had no business losing. And uh, like this past weekend against Mississippi State, who, by the way, Michael Van Buren Jr., very impressive quarterback, Mississippi State. Um, that's a game that a Jimbo team loses m more often than not on the road mm -hmm. in Starkville. So um, even if it wasn't our very best game under Mike Elko, getting out of there with a win, you know, that in the fourth quarter wasn't really in doubt by the end of it, um, that was impressive and a very big difference from what we've seen. Um, so uh, but on the question of the buyout, like – it's not it's not my money right so right. like would would i pay 75 million like no i would not but uh it, it absolutely had to be the right move i remember last season on my podcast i'm thinking you know after the bam and the tennessee game uh my buddy and i were like okay uh if we don't fire and, and i don't know if we said this on the air or not but uh, we're like if if jimbo fisher is the coach next season we may not even do a show because we know exactly what's going to happen we're going to beat mm -hmm. you know uh ball state or whoever you know prairie view in the in the in the preseason you know we'll probably pull out a close one against arkansas and then you know go six and six or seven and five and that's just what that's what jimbo did and in the close games he would coach scared he would not be uh you know aggressive or take risks uh and and yeah so after those two games that that was the breaking point for me where i was like you know if if our guys you know if our boosters have the money to do it uh then it needs to get done because if Jimbo's coaching this team a Texas would kill us um we, we we would probably sit here at like four and three right now and not you know six and one um and uh yeah it, it just be it would just continue to spiral down and just bottom out so um very thankful that we have people in oil or whatever else that will be able to contribute <laughs> to that because they signed on for it in the first place. So yeah. um, uh, thankfully they, they were able to, to make that work. Yeah. yeah. I would have to imagine, cause obviously for me as a Bama fan, the biggest thing that hung over our head when Saban was there is which Saban disciple is going to be the one that beats him. You know, who's going to kind of break that seal and be the first one. Right. I always thought it would be Kirby smart. Yeah. But it, wasn't. it was Jimbo Fisher. And, and Zach Calzada. that pained me yeah. more than I can even describe. Um, I hated it because I don't like Jimbo Fisher. And so I have to imagine that that might have played a little bit into it, right? Where you're you're beating this, this god of college football. You're the first one who's been a disciple to do it. You do it at home. It's insane. It was insanity. Um, so I have to imagine that also had some sort of contributing factor into keeping him well and what's what's crazy is uh it felt like Jimbo would only draw up good plays against Alabama like against everyone else he would just run the same old like predictable stuff and then against Alabama he's motioning guys and like you know running some tempo and I'm like where is this every other game that we play <laughs> you know and, I was like where uh, wait where was the team from last week because this wasn't them so yeah. you guys could just bring the same people yeah. in the plays that'd be great this isn't what we saw in film <laughs> yeah do. and the 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 jimbo saban off-season feud was quality television too <laughs> that, was, that was that season right yeah i think it was yeah this, yeah yeah i yeah. think yeah. so so yeah it so, was uh, uh it was interesting for sure yeah um uh jesse and matt did y'all have any other questions for will uh, i got one for you will uh the junction yeah. boys thoughts yeah, uh, it's a pretty cool story, right? Um, well, I, uh, I was speaking specifically of the movie. Yeah, great movie. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, yeah. Love it. <laughs> that, listen, I I saw that movie uh, when it came out on ESPN. I was like, "What is this?" And I was like, watching. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's Tom Berenger. I was like, "Yeah, oh, say Tom Berenger." Bear Bryant was a head coach at A and M. What is this? And then you watch it, you're like, "Oh, oh crap! This is some serious stuff." I absolutely love that movie. It's one of my favorite things about Texas A and M. I just wanted to bring. Yeah. It up. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I I need to go rewatch it. It's been a long time, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to write that down right now to to, mm -hmm. to to do that in the in the off season when when things get tough and we don't have football. <laughs> See, I've done I've done my good deed for the last couple. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, so real quick, a big 
huge game this upcoming weekend with LSU sure. and Texas A&M. What's your, what's your prediction for that one? If it was in Death Valley, I would have a much different opinion. Um, uh, so to go back to when I first joined or when, when I became an a fan, growing up, I never saw us beat Oklahoma until I got old, until I got, you know, in high school. And like, like we would even beat Texas as good as they were, you know, every now and then. We could never beat Oklahoma. And then when we joined the SEC, it took us years to finally – like we beat Bama the first year, didn't beat them after that for a long time. But – it took us forever to get that first win over LSU. And then since 2016, uh, the home team has won every time, you know, it's kind of gone back and forth and we have caught up to them. And from a talent standpoint where we had a pretty big def deficit when we first joined. Um, but that game has, you're right. It, it is absolutely massive for both these teams. Um, both lost the first game have won, you know, one other game since then the last two undefeated in conference teams. Um, it's it's a blackout at Kyle Field. Well, it hasn't been announced, but it's, they're going to announce it. It's a blackout. So I'm wearing all black right now. Um, but uh, black uniforms, LSU's wearing all white. It's going to be absolutely, you know, night game. It'll be rabid, um, raucous, loud, all that good stuff. Um, I think we win a close one. Uh, if it was over there, I would I would not favor us pulling it out. But um, the thing is, we, we have to, to play uh, – we have to get good quarterback play, which we've we've seen it at home from Connor Wigman, uh, especially against Missouri, but um, was shakier on the road this past weekend uh, in some aspects. And then in the secondary, we didn't allow the big plays last week, but we allowed the, you know, 10 to 15 yarders a little too often. Uh, LSU has a great quarterback and O-line and receiver. So um, I think it could be a higher scoring game than, than some people might think. But, um, you yeah, know, I like AM to pull out maybe a, you know, three to seven point win uh, at Cal Field. Okay. And you heard it here first. So uh, I love it. <laughs> Calling my shot. I hear you. Well, uh, Will, real quick before we let you go, where can everybody find you on the social medias? Yes. Uh, you can find uh, my personal account uh, at Will Stone CFB on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now. Um, it's Twitter. For, Twitter, yeah, but I, I, I will always say Twitter. <laughs> um, obviously, you can uh, read me at goodbullhunting.com, uh, at GB Hunting uh, on Twitter. And then the podcast is uh, the Ineligibles podcast. Um, that's at Ineligible Pod on uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or just the Ineligibles podcast on Spotify and Apple. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where you can get me. All right. Well, Will, thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate your perspective. Yeah, yep, appreciate you guys having me. Along with Matt and I, despite <laughs> our previous statements. Oh yeah, no uh, it's all in good fun. Y'all oh, are fun. Cult. Jimbo's not there anymore. It's all fine. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. that's right. We 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 are yeah. a cult. We fired Jimbo. Everything's great. Georgia, right. Georgia beat Texas. <laughs> I'm, good I'm right now. We, we talked about that. I'm not real thrilled about that, but <laughs> we'll we'll get into that. I'm sure. So, yeah. All right, Will. Appreciate it. Thanks, Will. Thanks, all right. Will. Thanks, y'all. Great to meet y'all. You too. All right. Well, what a fun interview. Um, it was a great to to hear an A and M fan's perspective. And you know, I know they get a lot of flack for being a, a cult, etc. But. uh he had some some good things to say about all that and the traditions and things like that. So I, I quite enjoyed it. So I can't say boo about them being passionate about that stuff. I mean, look, we we're burning incense behind us in this picture. So it is <laughs> that's right. Everybody's got we their own thing. A lot right? of fun. We all got along. See, you guys. That's right. It's, it's it's possible. It is possible. We can all be friends, except you, Missouri. You don't get it. <laughs> hey, we're gonna except we're gonna have. Miss, I think I think we have to have Old Miss on next because they've been brought up several times in the they past. Are, really they are they are catching strays left and right. They are, it's, it's and really, so it's really funny to watch. We need to we need to allow them. Let's get Lane on. Have their say. He liked a yeah. tweet of ours. Let's get Lane he on. Did. I'll be. He I'll actually responded. He retweeted with a response once. Did he? And granted, oh. it just said no, but still, he did it. So. I would love nothing more. Um, all right. So uh, let's Wait. go ahead and <laughs> let's go ahead and get into our predictions uh, for this upcoming uh, weekend's games. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble. 
All right. Well, the first game that we've got is Oklahoma four and three, one and three in the SEC at number 18, Ole Miss. Uh, that is five and two, a one and two in the SEC uh, noon on ESPN. I think uh, Oklahoma's offensive struggles continue in this one. Uh, and Jackson Dart and company are able to get a decent groove going. I'm going to go with Ole Miss here, uh, 35 to 13. Jesse, what do you got? Yeah, I think Ole Miss is going to be just fine out there in the Grove. I think they are going to be clicking on all cylinders on offense. And unfortunately, I don't think Oklahoma is going to be. So I'm picking Ole Miss 38 to 6. Matt? I, I completely agree. I think I think we've shown that Oklahoma is going to struggle mightily when it comes to um, offensive production. And again, I say that as a Tennessee fan. Um I think it's one of those situations where they're going to get behind and never really have a chance to get caught up. I think Ole Miss offense is going to put up some numbers here. So I'm going to say Ole Miss 42-10. All right. Next, we have Arkansas at 4-3, and 2-2 two and two in the SEC, at Mississippi State 1-6, and 0-4 oh in the SEC. That's 12-45 on the SEC network. Uh, this is kind of weird. I mean, so I've, I've watched Van Buren progress a lot the past few weeks, get a lot of confidence. He's playing with confidence. I like Mississippi State at home here. I'm going to go with the slight up upset, 31 to 24 Mississippi State. Jesse, what do you got? I really want to pick the Bulldogs in this one, but I I just don't know if I can. I think it might be another instance where they get really close. I think it's it's going to be a close game. Uh, I think Arkansas is coming off of a loss, and they're going to want to rebuild a little bit here. So I'm going to pick the Razorbacks in this one, 24 to 17. It's a good pick. Matt, what do you got? Yeah, I I also kind of am going to go with you on this one, Wes. I think the Cowbells are going to be out in force uh, in Starkville. I like Mississippi State here. I think Arkansas, I think they've been close the last couple of weeks. I think they finally get that win they're looking for. So I like MSU here, 28-21. All right, uh, next, number 21, Missouri, 6-1, and 2-1 one, uh, two and one in the SEC. At number 15, Alabama, 5-2, 2-2 two, two and two in the SEC, 330 on ABC, uh, look, Alabama's not playing like they want to right now. I get it. But Missouri just isn't the team that we thought they could be at the beginning of the season. So give me the tide in this one, 35 to 21. Jesse? I mean, how how do we have a worse record than Mizzou? I don't <laughs> make a big sense in the words of Matt. I'm going to go with Alabama on this one. Obviously, losing to anybody is really hard, but losing to Tennessee when you're at the university of Alabama, it's just abysmal. And we, we can't have that. We can't, we can't have that happen. We're back at home. Let's clean it up. Gentlemen. I think, I think we can do this, um, especially against a Missouri team. That's been a little sus. So I'm unfortunately, um, I think we're, we might be in for another heart attack, which makes me sad. Something that probably will look similar to how we played against South Carolina. I'm picking the tide 28 to 24. And just an adjustment, I think I said 35-21. I meant 28-21, as you can see on the notes there. Matt, what, Very yeah. confident. Yeah, Matt, what do you got on this one? Uh, listen, if you're a Missouri fan, you might want to go grab yourself a cigar. Um, because I think <laughs> – I'm just kidding with you. There's no chance in hell Missouri wins this ballgame. I'm going to pick Bama 27-24. Okay. All Sorry, right, well, I had, it, it was the shtick. I had to take a shot. Honestly, I, if you would have picked him, I would have been like, okay. <laughs> I hate to laugh at your misery, Jesse, but but you fair, be very just okay. It's it's making it's, me giggle. I I've just I've accepted it again. We're you know it's not the Shula years, so we're we're still better than that. Not yet. It's not yet. I, not I'm yet. not saying we won't get there, but like. <laughs> I what, had what, are the, entire, what are the stages of grief? Are we in acceptance? Is that where we're at we're right now? At the moment. Um, I've had an entire off season to deal with my Nick Saban grief and um, we're progressing. And again, okay. unlike a lot of Bama fans, I have been a fan my whole life. So I, I do remember what it's like to lose. <laughs> um, it's been a long time, but I do remember it. So it's fine. So, and, and real quick, and we're doing this on the fly. This is all, all happening on the fly here. Are we in agreement? So the game of the week, is that, is that cool with y'all below, yeah. below there? Okay. Yeah, all oh, right. Sure. So, all right. So number five, Texas, it's, this is not the game of the week that'll come later, but now we're going to talk about number five, Texas, six and one, two and one in the SEC at number 25, Vanderbilt, five and two, two and one in the SEC. That's 415 on the SEC network. All right. I'll watch out for this one. 
It's at Vandy. They feel disrespected being 18 and a half point underdogs as we record this show. Look, Vandy, Vandy wins, then nobody believes it's real, and then they just keep winning has <laughs> been the recipe for this year. So uh, dangerous game for the Longhorns coming off the type of loss that really makes you question your identity as well. Uh, I think this is a close one, but I do think Texas plays well enough to get the win in the end. I'm going Texas uh, 31 to 21. Jesse, what do you got? I have said it since we lost to them. I am now anchoring down on the Commodores <laughs> because if they win out, it makes it look a little less bad. So I'm going to pick Vandy in this one. Is it stupid? Probably. Am I going to do it? Who's yeah. to say what's stupid this year, right? Nobody knows. <laughs> everything's everything's wrong in this world right now. So um, I'm picking Vandy in a in a close one. And I honestly, I hope it ends up like this. I hope it's like a last second and it would be so much fun to watch. Oh, I'm picking yeah. the conference 28 to 27. I said what I said. They might have to get ready to pay another fine if that happens. Matt, what do you oh got? Oh, my God. I guarantee you they don't care. They'll pay it. Uh, no, they don't God. care. God. Can you I, – I don't know if I want to live in a world where Vandy has a win in the same – two top ten wins in the same season. I don't know if that's ever happened in the 100-some-odd years. 19 they had never like beaten a number one team in a, a, AP era. They had never beaten one. I, I don't even know where to start. Um, My heart wants to pick Vanderbilt. I want Vandy to win this game just for the <laughs> sheer chaos of it. And to our Texas friends that are watching, I'm sorry, but that crap would be really funny. Um, but at the same time, I know that Texas got it, took it on the chin this past week against UGA. I think that's going to end up getting them a little bit more focused. I think Texas ends up winning this thing. I think Vandy scores late to make it look a little closer than it is. But I like Texas here, 33-20. All right. Uh, next is, um, Auburn at Kentucky, uh, Auburn two and five, oh, and four in the SEC at Kentucky three and four, one and four in the SEC. That's seven forty five on the SEC network. Uh, these are two teams that are reeling kind of right now. Um, can Kentucky bounce back from an embarrassing loss in the swamp? Can Auburn get their first conference win? Um, again, I'm uh, in, in this one, I'm going to take the coin flip and give it to the home team here in a really ugly game. I'm going Kentucky 21 to 17. Jesse, what do you got? This, this is just, it's just weird. There's just, <laughs> I couldn't tell you the identity <laughs> of either of these teams. I couldn't tell you like for sure. Kentucky's going to do this on this side of the ball for sure. Auburn's going to do this on this one. I couldn't tell you anything. I have no idea. So yeah, same sort of thing, Wes. I'm going with the home team because why not at this point? Uh, I'm picking the Wildcats 24 to 17. There's no basis. This just is vibes. Yeah. Matt? I think it boils down to quarterback play, and I feel like it's better at Kentucky. Um, Auburn still does have a QB. I think it's going to come down to that. Um, I think Kentucky wins this thing in a squeaker at the very end, 20 to 14. Again, I need Hugh Freeze to figure out life. Figure it out, yeah. All right, let's move to the Pigskins and Pageantry game of the week. And this is a big matchup. Both of these teams undefeated in the conference so far. Number eight, LSU, 6-1, 3-0 in the SEC. At number 14, Texas A&M, 6-1, 4-0 in the SEC. 7-30 on ABC. Uh, as I said, both of these teams without a conference loss. A couple of weeks ago against Ole Miss, I gave the edge to LSU because they were at home. And they won that in a close one. Uh, this week, I'm going to give AM the edge at home. I am looking for Connor Wigman to bounce back after last week, and I'm looking for a stifling performance from that Aggie defense. So I'm going to go AM here, 24 to 21. Jesse, what do you got? This is going to be a fun one to watch. And this one really does have a lot of implications. I think you're you're going to see the true grit of both of these teams. And and I'm excited to see it. These are teams that respectively have very difficult places to play in but because it's at Kyle Field and it's a night game I have to go with Texas A&M on this one I I think they're very evenly matched and perhaps if it were in Death Valley it might go a different way but their fan bases and their stadiums play a key component in any game but especially at night so I'm going to go with the Aggies in this one I think it's going to be close I think it's going to be exciting and uh yeah picking Aggies 28 to 24. 
Yeah, we'll we'll enjoy hearing that pick. Matt, what do you got? Listen, if you told me that going into the very end of October, early November, that LSU and Texas A&M would be the best two on record teams in the SEC, I'd be like, you're drunk, go home. Um, but here we are. Uh, so this is going to be a fun one to watch. There's a reason why it's our game of the week, um, why it gets that seal of approval from the three of us. Um, and I like LSU here. Um, I think Nussmeyer has shown that he can throw the ball. I think there's some complimentary play on the defensive end. Occasionally it's been a bit streaky here and there. I like LSU here, so I'm going to pick LSU 35-28. Regardless, should be a good one. Looking forward to it. So um, that's all the games for this week. Let's go ahead and get out of here. Um, if you would like to contact us, please email us at, at pigskinsandpeasantry at gmail.com. We are at pigskinsandpeasantry on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And we are at PPSEC Podcast on X. And don't forget, we are available for download on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, TuneIn Radio, and most podcasting apps for iPhone, Android, and other oper- operating systems. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and review five stars we would love that increase our visibility and increase our chances to have conversations with wonderful people like yourselves and i made it through that whole segment without matt saying it's twitter wes i was um, i was too busy yeah. vibing i was passing the vibe check <laughs> um so uh yeah i'm really looking forward to uh the games this weekend dogs have a bye uh but still until next time this is wes go dogs it's really close to basketball season and nate oates is a gem <laughs> So, so there's that. And, and Mark Sears coming back. There are things to look forward to. Everything is fine. Okay. Roll tight. Hey, listen. Tennessee's on a bye this week. Smoke them if you got them, boys. Go Vols. <laughs>